to start in the dark, but didn't. there we go. <laughs> All right, good morning. We're going to get started this morning with an invocation by Pastor Keith Burkhart of First Southern Baptist Church, and that will be followed by the Pledge of Allegiance led by Blair Carsey of Girl Scouts, Troop 3469. Please stand. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to gather as citizens and city leaders, Lord. And God, you have been good to Oklahoma City. And God, I thank you that you have worked through generations to make Oklahoma City to be the kind of place people would want to raise a family, the best education, the best place to work. And God, you've made that possible through your blessings and your provision. And today I pray for our mayor, our city manager, and this council that you will lead them, you'll bless them, and God, you'll use them to continue to make Oklahoma City the greatest place anyone can live, whether it's a single mom, a family, a person coming from out of state. Lord, I pray we would be the city that is a shining star, and God, you've made that possible. And so, God, we want to thank you, bless them today, and God, I want to pray especially today for the Arts Festival, Lord. People, artists have come from all over the United States, and hundreds of thousands of people want to come and enjoy this festival. Lord, I pray that you will give opportunity for these artists to sell art, people in our city to enjoy it, even in the forecast. Lord, you're the God of the weather. And God, I pray you give us opportunity for this city to come together for such a great event as, as the Festival of the Arts. Bless this day. And Jesus, we thank you for all you've done for us. In your name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice. All right. Well, thank you so much, uh, Blair and Pastor Burkhart. And now I call this meeting of the City Council to order, and I do have one brief presentation up front if the folks from the Arts Festival will meet me there. Of course, as, ooh, as anybody who had to park this morning knows, uh, the Arts Festival has arrived, and we are very excited for that. Uh, in just a few hours, it will officially kick off, but uh, you guys were kind enough to break away and come by the City Council meeting this morning to, because uh, I know you probably have not been dressed this way for the last week. You've been, uh, and <laughs> yeah. Uh, to, to come and commemorate the occasion here uh, at City Council meeting. Obviously, especially with the location we've had for the last few years, we very much feel a part of this very important event in our city. And we would love to hear just a little bit more about it, and so I will ask the clerk to read this proclamation. Whereas Arts Council Oklahoma City is proud to announce the opening of the 57th Annual Festival of the Arts, on Tuesday, April 25th, 2023. And whereas the Festival of the Arts offers six days of exciting visual, culinary, and performing arts. And whereas the Festival of the Arts is nationally recognized as one of the most spectacular fine arts festivals in America, showcasing the works of more than 144 visual artists, live entertainment on two stages, delicious local foods, and activities for all ages. And whereas the Festival of the Arts is made possible by the dedic dedicated efforts of the 2023 Festival of the Arts co-chairs, Susie White and Farouk Kareem, whereas more than 40 committee members and 5,000 volunteers donate their time and talents to produce the festival, and whereas the Festival of the Arts in Oklahoma City's annual Rite of Spring, and it focuses on Arts Council Oklahoma City's mission to bring the arts and the community together. 
Now therefore, I, David Holt, Mayor of the City of Oklahoma City, do hereby proclaim the official opening of the 57th Annual Festival of the Arts on Tuesday, April 25th, 2023. Well, it's always a fun day. And we'd love to hear a little bit more uh, from the team here, and they have nominated Farouk to say a few words, one of this year's festival co-chairs, Farouk. Thank you, Mayor. We just wanted to thank you, the Mayor, and City Council for allowing us to come here and celebrate the best week of the year in Oklahoma City, the 57th Annual Festival of the Arts. Um, it's going to be a great week, and um, we, we invite everybody to uh, the Hall of Mirrors in the, in the Civic Center for opening ceremonies at 11. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you very much. Let's hear it for the team that puts the Arts Festival together. Thank you. Okay, now we're on items from Council, and it is Councilman Greenwell's final meeting, and so we have item 4A, a resolution of commendation for David Greenwell, Ward 5 Council member, and I would ask the clerk to read this resolution. Councilman, Councilman David Greenwell has been a devoted public servant representing the interests of his constituents in Ward 5 and the city as a whole. And whereas Councilman Greenwell has served the city with distinction for 12 years, championing important issues such as public safety, economic development, and neighborhood revitalization. And whereas Councilman Greenwell has made significant contributions to the city's financial policies and performance-based practices as chair of the city's audit committee and received an excellent peer review evaluation. He was also appointed by the state legislature as chair of the Oklahoma Accountancy Board for two terms. And whereas Councilman Greenwell has demonstrated his commitment to education by serving on the Oklahoma City Library Commission and Finance Committee for over 13 years, supporting secondary, graduate, and postgraduate education, and advocating for Oklahoma City and more public schools, Oklahoma City Community College, and the University of Oklahoma. And whereas Councilman Greenwell has been a strong advocate for infrastructure projects in Ward 5 and citywide initiatives and has facilitated economic development through strong policy development, supporting the fairgrounds as a key economic driver for Oklahoma City, and is a member of the Alliance for Economic Development. And whereas Councilman Greenwell has brought increased awareness to public transportation and is an enthusiastic biker and has served on the Finance Committee of the Scissortail Foundation to develop organizational and financial policies. And whereas Councilman Greenwell has also served on the Committee for the Location of the USS OKC Sale, attended the change of command, and proudly represented our city as Vice Mayor for the ceremonial festivities. And whereas Councilman Greenwell's dedication to improving the quality of life in our city is demonstrated by his long-term membership and support of the Committee of 100. And whereas Councilman Greenwell identified a source of funding for the new Capitol Hill branch of the Oklahoma City Community College, which has revitalized the old Capitol Hill retail sector of Commerce Street and has further contributed to the economic development of the entire area. And whereas Councilman Greenwell has tirelessly worked towards improving the quality of life for all residents of Oklahoma City, promoting positive change and fostering a sense of community throughout the city. Now therefore be it resolved by the Mayor and Council of the City of Oklahoma City that they do hereby recognize and commend Councilman David Greenwell for his exemplary service to the city and its residents. Thank you, Amy. Well, maybe we'll uh, have any comments anybody wishes to make, and uh, maybe then we'll vote on it, and then maybe we'll give uh, Councilman a chance to say a few words. Uh, so we'll start with any comments from Council? Todd? Yeah, please. Uh, Councilman Greenwell, I just I wanted to say how much I've uh, appreciated being able to serve with you. And, you know, you've done, a, I think, a great job of representing Ward 5 in Oklahoma City. I really appreciate your professionalism. Uh, 
your fiscal expertise has come into play on so many items for us. And also your, your request for measures on every time that we start to try a new project or something like that. Um, just that you relate to us the need to make sure that we have measures in place to show that it's, it's having the effect that we all thought it would have. So I just want to say thank you very much. Mark? Yeah, a couple of things. Um, there was an interview recently with David, and uh, the one thing that stood out to me uh, when I read this interview was uh, we, he said, we can accomplish so much more when we all work together, and that's David. Um, he says, early on, my family's perspective has always included a responsibility to share and participate and share any knowledge or expertise or resources that we may have with the community. So I had got involved early on uh, upon graduating from college, becoming involved in various civic and charitable organizations. That eventually led to me running for city council in 2011. Um, when I first got on the city council, uh, I would go from time to time to David with questions. And um, he one day told me, Mark, it's taken me four years to learn this job. I'm still learning. But the wing thing I always enjoyed about David's perspective is when I would ask him a question, it may be two or three days later and he would call me back and um, he would say, have you thought about this? Maybe you should think about that and never telling me what I should do, but making me think about what I should think about would be best for the city. And so I've always appreciated that. I finally had Miss Debbie Martin come up with four or five things you don't know about David Greenwell. Number one, he is passionate about his three grandsons. Number two, he is the only council person that worked tirelessly on seed clouding to stop a drought in Oklahoma City. Uh, number three, in 2016, he was accepted into and graduated from the Harvard Kennedy Executive Education Program. So we have a Harvard man here with us today. He also was instrumental in developing the MBA program with the president's staff at the University of Oklahoma. And because of his work today, we have an MBA program in Oklahoma City. And last but not least, Debbie thought I should mention that uh, he's good friends with the, the Bradford family, Sam Bradford. And one of his funnest events he ever went to was the 2008 Heisman Awards where he got to see Sam win the Heisman Trophy. And so, um, David, I can't thank you enough for everything you've done for us. I also uh, want to thank your wife, Pam, for over, uh, who you've been married to for over 40 years. I'm not going to put you on the spot and ask how many, but um, uh, I will say she's worked tirelessly for 12 years. Uh, by your side, and we appreciate her very much. Uh, good luck in your future endeavors. Thank you. Thank you. And a city manager would like to say sure. a few words. Councilman, I just wanted to say thank you for your service for the city, and I got to work closely with Councilman Greenwell from the financial perspective, and really even in working in finance, when we would have items that came forward, we'd always have to be prepared for the David Greenwell questions. Like we knew <laughs> they would be coming in the audit committee, working with him is just always wanting to do the right thing financially so that we did the right thing for our residents. And I really think that that pictures the way he's tried to serve is doing the right thing. And so thank you so much for your service and your work with us and your leadership. All right, well, we'll uh, let's hear. Oh, yes. Sorry. I know, what a shock. <laughs> um, I just wanna read from someone here, <clears throat> a quote. You never know who you are going to meet on the bus. I get to engage in many conversations during the ride. And that was Councilman Greenwell. Uh, this was from a Gazette article <clears throat> back in, make sure I get that date right. That is from July uh, 2014. I would hope that whoever succeeds David um, remembers those words because before Councilwoman Hammond and I came onto this horseshoe in 2019, it was David Greenwell. And I think too often what we don't do is acknowledge when someone who doesn't agree with us politically and philosophically has a good idea. And trust me, David and I disagree on a lot. But sometimes we have like two hour conversations when we used to serve on the transit trust together. We would sit right here on this horseshoe after the meeting would end and just kind of have a back and forth. I'm, I'm two hours one time we sat here. 
Um, and I think we need more of that. And it's not that he convinced me or I convinced him, and trust me, that gulf remains, but his early advocacy for public transportation and his hopping on a bike to take Route 40 or Route 16, and the fact that he knows those numbers, you know? I just think that's very important because it puts you in contact with people in the city you might otherwise see, and you learn from other people's perspectives. So, you know, um, I, I just want, I, I will always remember those memories, uh, not just the disagreement, but truly a two hour conversation we had right here on this horseshoe when no one else was, was around. And um, you know, maybe we'd all benefit a little more from that. Um, so, thanks. Okay. All right. Well, we can now adopt the resolution, and then we'd love to hear some valedictory thoughts from Councilman Greenwell. Got a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Councilman Greenwell, I guess you're expected to vote for it. Passes unanimously. And Councilman Greenwell, we'd love to hear some thoughts from you. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, and it's just a listing of thank yous for, to everyone that uh, I've had the opportunity to work with. Uh, but I do need to begin with my wife, Pam. Uh, everyone who is married recognizes that this job is a joint effort uh, while I'm not very well recognized in Ward 5 in terms of going out to grocery stores or restaurants or places like that. Pam is, and so she's the one who gets most of the comments from the public, and uh, sometimes they're favorable and sometimes they're not. But anyway, so she serves as a great buffer as well as a supporter uh, throughout these 12 years, and I certainly do appreciate all of her uh, help with this job. Secondly, uh, I'd like to thank our council staff. Um, most people don't realize that they are the ones who do 99% of the work. We may cast a vote, but they're the ones who are dealing directly with the public, uh, receiving these phone calls, helping us to respond to emails, and uh, just a great resource. Uh, so that begins with Debbie Martin, uh, who unfortunately was assigned to me to uh, support, as well as being the chief of staff. And so she, uh, from day one, well, even before day one, she was extremely helpful, and to this day, I would not vote on anything without her perspective. Uh, just because of her experience, her understanding of uh, issues. Uh, Boyd Fulton and James Irwin, both on our uh, council staff, are also uh, extremely helpful. <laughs> and those two help us get through the day a lot with some uh, they don't take everything as seriously as other people do, so they're extremely helpful from that point. Uh, Craig, also, I wanna thank you, especially all of your work. Even before you became city manager, you were just uh, a very important asset to the city. And also, every person that works here, and I'm sincere about this, there's no one that I can think of who doesn't put forth their very best effort. Now, sometimes things don't go as planned, but it's not because it's due to a lack of effort. So we have truly the greatest employees of any government body that I know of. Uh, so I just wanted to share that. Uh, and then also the current members of the council, I appreciate everyone, uh, mayor and all the council members, appreciate your efforts and thoughts and ideas. Uh, and also I'd like to thank 
the members of the council who were present when I first joined back in 2011, their years of experience and wisdom that they were so willing to uh, share with me was invaluable. And even members prior to that, members of the council prior to that, uh, would share their ideas with me on occasions. And uh, you cannot replace experience. And so I appreciate everybody's ideas. Uh, let me make sure I've not left somebody out. Uh, yeah, and also every citizen of Oklahoma City, those who have called in with uh, their thoughts and ideas, and even at times complaints, it's helpful that they do that, and I hope that they continue to do that, as well as sending us emails, and especially those who take the time to come down to City Council and speak to us, every voice is listened to and has an impact uh, I think, on our decisions. So I hope that we can even increase the amount of uh, participation by our citizens. And then my final comment, <clears throat> I'm looking forward to sitting at home or somewhere and watching these council meetings and hopefully I'll be around someone I can complain to at the time and say I can't believe they made that decision but I know Ward 5 will uh, be represented very well. Matt Hinkle has served on the Planning Commission for many years. He's been very involved throughout the community at Ward 5. So Ward 5 uh, will soon get an excellent council person. Uh, and I know the entire city is going to benefit as a result of his uh, joining the council. So. Again, thank you all, uh, and uh, I, I truly do uh, mean all of these uh, people that I've mentioned and the thanks to them because uh, I couldn't have done the job without everyone's help. So thank you. Thank you, Councilman. We still have a couple things on items from council. Uh, we have 4B1, which is a resolution appointing a municipal judge. And uh, I understand we do need to go into executive session to discuss this. Uh, of course, our, our session will be led by the Judiciary Committee, which is chaired by Councilman Stonecipher. Um, so why don't we go ahead and take a vote to do that and, and go ahead and get that out of the way. So that's B2, entering into executive session. Got a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. We will now go into executive session and we will return.
All right, we are back from executive session, and uh, we are back on item 4B1, a resolution appointing a municipal judge. And I'll turn to Chair of the Judiciary Committee, Councilman Stonecipher, for a verbal motion that will then follow up electronically. Thank you, Your Honor. At this time, um, myself, uh, Nikki, Joe Beth, and David would like to um, make a motion for a resolution. The resolution will be appointing Kendall Tallwater as municipal judge for the remainder of the current two-year term uh, that was previously held by Jason Glidewell. And so at this time, I'd move for approval of the resolution with the addition of the applicant's and candidate's name. All right, now let's handle that electronically. Why don't we, why don't we have, uh, since he went to all that trouble, why don't we have Councilman Stonecipher as the There we go. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously and with the required six affirmative votes for salary approval and salary was mentioned in the resolution. All right, congratulations to our new judge and thanks again to the committee for your work. All right, item five, city manager reports. Mr. City Manager. The only two things we have today are the claims and payroll, which you can find at OKC.gov, the April sales and use tax check. So uh, again, strong check at 6% growth. Overall, we're 7.7% growth on sales tax for the year. On use tax, we're, we were at 23% growth for the month, and overall, it's uh, just under 10% growth for the year. Combined, we're $24.7 million ahead of target. And what we're doing today, the action we'll do today to introduce the budget amendment addresses some of this. It's been a really strong year. We're looking to use some of that for some one-time purposes to restore some reserves and address some issues that we have. And we'll see that in the uh, consent docket. And uh, that's all the information I have right now. All right, thank you. Item six, Journal of Council Proceedings. We can take items A and B with one motion. A motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Item 7 is request for uncontested continuances. Item 11D is already listed on the agenda as being deferred to May 9th. Mr. City Manager, what else might you have? Beginning on page 12. Item 11S1. All of these items will be stricken from the agenda. Item C, 2806 South Harvey Avenue. The owner is secured. Item D. 2113 Hood Avenue, the owner is secured. Item E, 2117 Hood Avenue, the owner is secured. Item F, 2121 Hood Avenue, the owner is secured. Item J, 12310 Southwestern Avenue, the owner is secured. Item L, 1328 Northwest 9th Street, the owner is secured. Item M, 819 Northeast 16th Street, the owner is secured. Item N, 5101 Northwest 16th Street, the owner is secured. Item S, 1005. Northwest 31st Street, the owner is secured. Item V, 3236 Southwest 37th Street, the owner is secured. And item X, 1152 Northwest 57th Street, the owner is secured. On page 13, item 11T1, all of these will be stricken from the agenda. Item C, 2806 South Harvey Avenue, the owner is secured. Item D, 2113 Hood Avenue, the owner is secured. Item E, 2117 Hood Avenue, the owner is secured. Item F, 2121. Hood Avenue, the owner is secured. Item I, 12310 Southwestern Avenue, the owner is secured. Item J, 819 Northwest, Northeast 16th Street, the owner is secured. Item M, 3117 Northwest 24th Street to re-notify the owner. Item R, 3236 Southwest 37th Street, the owner is secured. And item T, 1152 Northwest 57th Street, the owner is secured. That's all the items that I have. All right. Thank you. We're now at item 8, revocable permits and events. Uh, item 8A is a memorandum of understanding with the YMCA of Greater Oklahoma City for the OKC Metro Senior Games using various City of OKC parks and rec uh, facilities. Uh, no one has signed up to speak and it's all across the city, so we can just take a motion. Got a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. 
Item 8B is a revocable permit with OKC Public Tennis LLC to host hold the OSSAA State Tennis Championships um, May 6, May 5th through 6th and 12th through 13th. And we've got Tim Ritchie who has uh, signed up to speak. And Good morning, Mayor, Council. Um, we are hosting the Oklahoma City Boys and Girls State Tennis Tournament at the Tennis Center at 3400 North Portland on May 5th, 6th and May 12th, 13th, asking for a permit. And uh, in the past, we have made Pat Murphy Drive a one-way street for that event, uh, just for the uh, sake of traffic control. Okay. Councilman Cooper? Yeah. Uh I see no reason not to move this item enthusiastically. In fact, and I wish you all uh, well. So, all right, I've got a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Thanks. All right, item 8C is a revocable permit with uh, Zotong Organization of America for the ZOA event May 27th through the 28th using Wendell Wisenhunt and Joseph Fong has signed up to speak. Good morning, mayors and council. My name is Glory and this is Joseph Tom. Uh, we're here to ask permit for Oklahoma's, or not Oklahoma, Zoto Organization of America. Uh, it's the 14th annual zero event, and it will take place in Wendell West Hunt Sport Complex on May 27 to 28, 2023. And the reason for this event is to um, meet with every Zotong people living across the uh, United States and just to have fun and get to know each other. Thank you. All right, thank you. Councilwoman Peck. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, we'll move for approval. Thank you. Right, we have a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. All right, item 8D is a revocable right-of-way use permit with Girls on the Run Central Oklahoma to hold the Girls on the Run of Central Oklahoma Celebratory 5K on May 6th. No one has signed up to speak. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> I got in a car accident on my way here, so. <laughs> so sorry to hear that. Um, That's okay, we're, we're all good. Everything's all good, everything's okay. But she just, my program director did, we, I forgot to tell her to sign in, so okay. she'll okay. let you know. Um, we just we're just step forward a little bit more. I'm sorry. We're girls on the run of Central Oklahoma. We um, offer an empowerment and self-esteem program for girls, K, uh, third through eighth grade, that creatively integrates running. They do a 10-week program, meeting twice a week, that ends with a celebratory 5K. Um, this is our 13th year. Um, Pre-pandemic, we had 685 girls down in Bricktown, and we have gotten and grown back, building back better. Um, to 300 girls that will be joining us on May 6th for our 5K at the Bricktown Ballpark in Oklahoma City. Great, all right. Thank you, Councilwoman Nice. Well, let me say, I'm all about some girl empowerment. So yes. uh, this sounds like an amazing event and I'd love to connect with you all afterwards to see how we can integrate this a little more um, in some of our other communities. Yes, we would love it. Um, we are in central Oklahoma. We have um, 22 sites right now, 311 girls, all parts of Edmond, Norman, Oklahoma City, and they'll all be coming to. So we'd love to invite you to come out and cheer the girls. Many of them are going to be running their very first 5K on May 6th. What time does it start? 9 a.m. All right. Well, I'm excited about all these girls yes. coming uh, really to Bricktown. Fun. And uh, for that, I will move for approval. Thank you. All right, we have a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Now we'll recess the council meeting and convene as the Oklahoma City Municipal Facilities Authority, uh, where we have items A through D we can take with one motion. We have a motion and a second. Cast your votes.
passes unanimously. Now we'll adjourn to OCMFA and convene as the Oklahoma City Public Property Authority. We only have claims and payroll, but we'll go ahead and take a vote. We have a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. We'll adjourn OCPPA and reconvene as the council uh, where we are on item nine, the consent docket. We do have scheduled presentations for items A, Y, A, Z, B, A, and B, B. Is there any other item that a council member wishes to pull out for a separate vote or discussion? Um, I need to step out for item A, D. Okay. Item P, I would like to discuss, please. P is in Paul. P is in Paul. Okay. Item B, C for me, please. Okay. Uh, Mayor, let's see. just the update on the super span on AL, please. And I think that's it. I'm oh, sorry, what, what was the AL? Yes, please. Okay. Is that it? Yep. Thank um, you. Okay. Also, I can't remember if you had mentioned item B, E, but if not, I would like to ask some questions about that if there's not a presentation. Uh, B is in boy, E is in Eric? Is Correct. Okay. All right. Why don't we start uh, with the separate vote, item 9AD. This is a... Uh, First Amendment to the 2021 Continuum of Care Program Operating Agreement with Mental Health Association, Oklahoma. We could get a motion just on that item, 9AD. We have a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Okay, now we'll take the rest of the items in order, which means we'll start with item P, Councilman Stonecipher. You know, when I was reading this on Saturday or Sunday, I came upon item P, which is a $124,000 donation from Miss Billy D. Brown's estate. And um, I've never seen anything like that in, in that amount of money. And so I was talking to Debbie Martin and uh, looked up her obituary, and I thought it would be appropriate for us to recognize her. Uh, Billy D. Brown passed away peacefully on October 6, 2020. She was born in Oklahoma City on October 20th, 1933. She met the love of her life, Rufus Brown, and the two were married for over 40 years. She worked as an assistant for the VP of Globe Life Insurance for many years and loved her work. She also had a lifelong love for animals. And so I don't know if she still has family around, but um, I'd like to tell her family thank you for this generous contribution. The one thing she did ask is that uh, uh, there be um, uh, trees planted in her memory, and so I'm hoping somewhere out there we might be able to plant her a tree. Thank you. Thank you. Item AL, Councilman Cooper. Yes, uh, Director Winger, if you could just provide, I'm sure, what will be a brief but you know important update, I'm sure, for this project. Thank you, Councilman. So, item AL today is an amendment and also a final acceptance for our super fan project that uh, that we're working on um, this is a 2017 general obligation bond project we're actually doing some repairs to a major drainage bypass that's in the vicinity of interstate 44 and class and boulevard it's completely underground um, it's a very large structure so it can't be seen from the surface um, this amendment is actually reducing the final quantities for some items that weren't needed for the repairs um, and as I mentioned um, the the project is nearly complete and we're preparing it for a final acceptance very soon Thank you for your update. Welcome. Okay. So that brings us to the scheduled presentations. Uh, there's four of them right in a row. We'll start with the AY. So Chris York, our budget director, is going to present this uh, budget amendment. I mentioned this before uh, with the growth in sales tax. There's several other items that are on here, not just addressing the growth that we've seen in sales tax this year and addressing that, but Chris will cover the uh, recommended amendments to the budget for this year. 
Thank you, City Manager. Uh, Chris Short, Finance Department. Uh, so the item today is part one of our two-part process to amend the budget. Uh, today is the introduction, and we'll bring this back to you in a couple of weeks. Uh, it does impact a number of funds, and I'll walk through those with you. I should mention that this is amendment number three for the year and expected to be our last amendment. Uh, if I had to summarize the big moving pieces, though, what I would say is that we are capturing uh, uh, revenue beyond what was forecasted, beyond what was budgeted, um, and using that to fund a number of projects that we have before you, um, as well as to restore the reserves in our Capital Improvements Projects Fund. Uh, that fund's reserves have just dwindled down um, over the last few years um, due to projects not unlike the list that's in front of you, just with the size and uh, age of some of our facilities. It costs a lot of money to keep up with those. But just jumping right into it, um, the first proposed increase is to the Capital Improvements Projects Fund for $16.15 million. Um, and that includes a number of projects on your list here. I won't read them all, but I'll just highlight a couple. We have the City Hall Plumbing Repair at $3.4 million. Um, we have funding for the Key to Home Encampment Rehousing Initiative at $2 million. Uh, we have a project for Bricktown Canal Lighting at $1.5 million. Uh, we have some funding uh, for uh, traffic signal requests at $1.2 million. Um, some supplemental funding for the Embark headquarters at a million dollars, um, and then 400,000 for the Civic Center Music Hall for their sound shaper. And that gets us to a 6.15 million uh, increase to that fund. Uh, the next change is for the fire sales tax. This is um, language you'll recognize from a prior uh, council meeting on April 11th, where we amended the public safety sales tax resolution. This is simply applying what you've already approved to the budget, uh, and that will increase by $4.2 million in that fund. In the general fund fire department, uh, we have an increase of $1.1 million roughly, um, and this is to get started with a limited medical transport uh, supplemental program in the fire department. Or we'll, we'll be able to um, assist our uh, partners in EMSA. Uh, we also have an increase in non-departmental, um, and this one will require a little bit more explanation, but it's for $29 million. 16.1 of that is from the CIP increase I just briefed you on for those list, that list of projects. The balance of that um, will be sent over to the CIP fund as well, but no additional authority is being asked for. That's to build back those reserves that I discussed earlier. We have an increase in the general fund for parks and recreation um, of $53,000. Um, this is related to mowing services that we provide for Aquit, um, and it will be funded by the Aquit Trust. Likewise, in the General Fund for Public Works, we have an increase of 800000 You saw uh, almost this exact same type of increase on the prior amendment, and this is related to road repair following a water or sewer line pavement cut um, that Public Works manages, and then the utility department uh, ultimately pays us back for. In the Hotel Motel Tax Fund, we have a $1.5 million increase, um, and this is uh, in order to send uh, all of the revenue that we receive um, from the hotel motel tax through the OCPPA so that we can uh, service our bonds and it's required by our bond indenture. This money has already been received. We're just asking for additional authority to utilize it. Uh, in the internal service fund, we have a $1.2 million increase related to fuel and parts um, and fund balance will be the funding source for that. They have a healthy fund balance at about 19.5% even after this amendment. Special Assessment Districts Fund is also receiving an increase of 226000 This is for revenue received uh, above what we budgeted for, and so we're just asking for additional authority to use those funds um, as they've been dedicated. Um, similarly to the Hotel Motel Tax Fund, in the Zoo Sales Tax Fund, we have a $2.3 million increase. Again, performance has been better than expected. We've received these dollars. Um, now we just need the authority to send it over to the trust. So all in all, we're looking at a increase of $40.12 million, a total budget for FY23 um, at $1.9 billion, and the general fund operating budget will come to $601 million. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Okay, no questions? Um, Thank you. AZ, thanks, Chris. Thanks, Chris. AZ. Dylan, AZ, Kenny Sudel with the Alliance for Economic Development is here to introduce this uh, proposed ordinance. Good morning, Kenny Sudel with the Alliance. Uh, one second, let me get my notes out here. On item AZ, this is a ordinance to be introduced and set for a final hearing and originally it's May 9th. We do need to ask for a 
change on this, and city clerk will have to help me on this, May 23rd, so I don't know if we need to do uh, an amendment or not on this. Uh, we had... I'll so you need, you need the, he the final hearing to be May 23rd? May 23rd, correct. So what happened, next steps on this, just to, and I'm kind of jumping a little bit to the end, but I'll back up. This, the, this is a change to our innovation district, uh, TIF district. It's a little bit different in that because of where it lays, it also has to go through, it has to go this, the same process, TIF review committee, city council, planning commission. Uh, it also has to go through the capital medical zoning. They canceled their last, their meeting that this was scheduled to be on, so we've had to move it uh, from, uh, subsequent to getting this docketed, we've had to move that. So we need to ask to have this moved to the 23rd. So that is one change. I don't know if we have to. I think we probably need to amend it. Do a quick amendment vote on that. Okay. Yeah. Well, I want to get that housekeeping right. piece right, out of the way. Now I'll tell you what we're doing. Right. We'll do that so, in a moment, but um, let's not forget. If you'll go to the map really quick. So <clears throat> this body made a change already to the downtown uh, TIF district, and we kind of foreshadowed at that time that this amendment was coming forward. If you'll recall, there's already been some amendments to remove several properties. The properties that sort of abutted uh, the west side of 235, we removed those from the downtown properties, or downtown TIF district. And this change would be, as we told you, this was coming at that time, to add this back into the innovation uh, uh, project plan. So in the red, this is area P, it, most of that, uh, most of the properties from the south on up to about uh, 13th Street were previously in the downtown project plan. There are some additions of the properties that are north of 13th, as well as uh, there's a piece that uh, goes across the School of Science and Math properties. I want to reiterate we don't have any projects there. This is one of those things that's public property that doesn't pay any taxes right now and so we wanted just in the future if they decided to do any development have that opportunity. Um, as a reminder on this map there are several TIF districts uh, 11 and 7 that are currently uh, in place and going. There's uh, District M which is south of 4th Street and District N which have already been approved and created they just have not been activated yet. Um, and then it would also slightly change the, pro the project area boundaries as well. If you go to the next slide. <clears throat> the budget would also be amended. The majority of it, uh, the, the estimate is that there, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot one back up. I forgot a really important one. There's also a little striped area, 17. This is a, all the rest of the amendments would be ad valorem taxes. The 17 is actually a sales tax for construction only on the convergence project. This, pro this would be um, just for that property, only for the construction of it. It's the intent that um, we will be applying for the Leverage Act to try to be able to uh, leverage further and get matched those sales tax funds. As you recall, there's an incentive package already put together, uh, and this does not change that incentive package for the Convergence Project. Part of that package is the Redevelopment Authority put in significant TIF dollars. There was also a loan that went uh, for $5 million from the Economic Development Trust uh, to the Redevelopment Authority to help with that package. This is part of the plan to help repay those funds. So again, does not increase the incentives to that project, but helps provide another source of repayment for those uh, incentives that were provided previously. So if you'll go to the next one, that's Increment District 17. That's the $2.5 million uh, budget amendment on that piece. The other piece, the red on the map, would be a $90 million uh, increase. The budget is $5 million for placemaking, $4 million for implementation, seventy-one million to support development, and then $10 million in the category revenue for public entities. As a reminder, on the innovation uh, TIF district, uh, we have this category that's a little bit unique that provides uh, STEM education for uh, northeast side students and teachers. It's something that we had just started last year, the first allocations to that program. Uh, this would provide you know, potential additional budget in the future should this develop, these developments occur. And these are our best estimates at this time of what kind of development would be generated. Um, in keeping with state law, just wanted to reiterate you know, that we did a financial impact analysis for the taxing jurisdictions. 
Uh, it's estimated that there could be up to $500 million of public and private development in this area. We expect you know, increases in ad valorem collections, sales tax, and job growth. And we don't believe there to be any significant adverse impact to the other taxing jurisdictions. So prior actions, that TIF review committee that comprises those different jurisdictions has reviewed this and found it to be appropriate, appropriate recommended approval. We've also taken it through the Planning Commission. Uh, they review it and make sure that it fits in uh, with, with uh, the city's comprehensive plan. And they have recommended approval as well. Let's go to the next slide. Um, so the next step would be uh, May 19th, uh, Capital Medical Zoning Commission would consider it. And then May 23rd, we would set a second uh, public hearing. So today is the first public hearing. So the public's welcome to make comments on this. Um, and we would ask that this be amended to set the final hearing on May 23rd, which would be another public hearing and consider adoption of it. We would request on May 23rd that we have a, uh, that ordinance be adopted with emergency if possible, because we do, as I mentioned, the, the convergence project, as you well know, it's under construction already. So we're losing opportunities on that TIF district. We can't collect any of those uh, sales tax funds on the construction until after this is approved. So that's one reason we'll be asking for that, which is different. We did not ask for that on previous TIF amendments. Um, so with that, be happy to answer any questions on this change to the Innovation District Project Plan. If there aren't any questions, Your Honor, at this Let's time. Let's do the amendment. Yeah. I'm going to do the amendment, which is, uh, the ordinance AZ to be introduced, but set for a final hearing on May 23rd, okay. 2023. All right, so this motion is just to amend that final hearing date. This is not adoption of the item. We have a motion and a second. Pastor votes. Passes unanimously. Uh, final hearing date is now set for May 23rd. Okay, any other questions on AZ? If not, we can proceed to BA. So I'm going to talk about BA and BB are related, but we do need to talk separately about BA. And this is a, a, a proposed amendment to the Corps de Shore uh, TIF plan to facilitate the TIF requests that will be coming on BB. So uh, as a reminder, we this is a map of the approved TIF districts in the Corps de Shore plan. This one that is in blue, that's A, that is currently TIF 13. That is the TIF that uh, the Omni is in, the BOK building is in. Um, what this proposal would do is carve the little bitty pink piece, which is the proposed, the proposed Boulevard Place development, to provide a few extra years. Uh, currently, I believe TIF 13 has about 20 years left. 21, I think, and so this would give it 25. It's about a 1.3 acre site, so it's a really small site. On the budget, there would, overall, there would be no change on the budget. What we would be doing is uh, removing 27 million uh, of the budget from the, the other categories, really from the District A, TIF 13, and putting it in this new district that's proposed of District G. Um, same thing, we've done an impact analysis that you know, it, would, it would facilitate this $83 million development project. There would be no adverse impacts to other taxing jurisdictions. The future positive impact would be hopefully it would take something that's generating zero in tax dollars now and uh, put it to $1.3 million of annual ad valorem tax. This, kind of like the other amendments, has gone through the TIF Review Committee, that body with all the other taxing jurisdictions. They have reviewed it. Uh, and found it to be appropriate and recommended approval. The Planning Commission has also reviewed it uh, for compliance with the comprehensive plan and recommended approval. Um, and on this one, uh, it would, this again would be a public hearing today, the first public hearing. It would be receiving the, introduce, the introduction of it and setting the second public hearing for May 9th, uh, 2023. And this is, we are looking at this being together in concert with the ask that's coming next on BB, which I will talk about. And we also have the developers here to talk about. Okay. 
I'm curious, uh, oh, question here. Yeah. I'm quite curious, um, when we look at these committees, uh, who, who makes up our committees that are making these, this, these prior recommendations that are sent to council? Um, and specifically, as I look at comparison for this court ashore TIF and the innovation district TIF, there are uh, staunch differences as uh, funding projects and um, where we look at how that money goes back into the community. Um, so that's where my concern is for, for both of these and the projects that we tend to find favor for in comparison to projects that actually really need funding, um, which could be the smaller projects to maybe some that are maybe uh, maybe larger, but specifically those smaller projects. So that's probably three questions in my ask. Sure. Um, but the main question is, who is the makeup of the committees that ultimately make these recommendations? So the chair is the mayor of, the, of those two committees. Uh, we also have representatives from Oklahoma County, from uh, ID9 School District, from Metro Tech, from um, the library system. We have them from City County Health. Uh, I'm trying to remember if I'm leaving out another. I think those are the public entities. And then each of those has a different set of at-large uh, members, which are recommended by the mayor and, and then voted on by the committees themselves. Well, that's, I wonder, that's not true. <laughs> so, so, the, so the taxing jurisdictions select their own people, as you were just saying. Y yes, I'm sorry. The at-large members were appointed at the beginning of the life of the TIF and are essentially um, lifetime appointments. Um, and so I've never really had any role in at-large unless there's been a vacancy. Yes, that's my mistake. Which is you're usually correct, literally correct. by death. <laughs> yeah. is how I end up having vacancies, which is, I've had two in five years. So it's made up of all those jurisdictions that are affected by the, the change in the um, ad valorem collections. Okay. Well, I think that just proved the issue that I have. Uh, a lifetime commitment uh, for the TIF, which would be about 25 years, when we have many different projects, many different people, many different things, many different uh, pieces that have to continue to be a part of these TIFs, and we still have the same people at the table that can't speak to half of, of the developments that we really need in the community. So that's, that's an issue for me as we look at TIFs, as we look at even um, for, for myself, understanding fully what a TIF is. I can read this all day. I can read this all day. I can look at uh, the boundaries all day. But when I talk to the people in my community about how this is going to impact them and how this can benefit them, I don't have an answer. So that's, that's where my concern is about amending these TIFs, uh, bringing these TIFs forward, and still, again, who's truly getting the benefit? Because I, I was silently thinking through the Innovation District TIF because there's so many other things going on. But now, as we look at this particular TIF and the thing that's, that's this uh, prefaces for the next item that we're gonna speak about, that is very interesting, again, of the priorities and how we find funding for some things and fully funded, but yet, I can't get a street light, a simple light. So that, that's where I have difficulty understanding TIFs and, and who they're going to benefit. And again, the process that we take, in my opinion, of favoring uh, projects instead of taking a look at all of the things uh, that we should and we still barely know who's applying or asking for a meeting to understand how they can benefit uh, from the program of what a TIF can bring for their development. Well, I would just like to say, I mean, this is the system we have in place from state law. This, there are representatives, the representative, you know, the different bodies choose who their representatives are. Um, in terms of 
having meetings, I don't know that there's anybody who's ever asked for a meeting to talk about a project that I've not taken or that Joanna's not taken. So I'd just like to say publicly, if folks have a project they're interested in talking about, you know, we talk to folks all the time about that. Um, so I'm, if there's somebody I'm not aware of, please let me know because we're happy to talk to anybody about projects and we do all the time. Well, let me be, be more clear. Um, it, it, it's not the fact that you aren't, all aren't taking meetings from folks. It's the fact that even when people ask me for a meeting after your meeting, I can't explain to them what they need to do next or how they can get the funding. So that's where the difference maker is. I understand what you're saying, trust, I get it. But again, when I have to relate that message or talk through it or have to understand it, that's where the difficulty is. And again, here we are, back to the drawing board for what we're about to look at and talk through next, um, when initially we, we didn't have the things in place for that. Hey, you and I have had several conversations about um, having workshops where uh, mm -hmm. we come together and not only um, for the benefit of the people on the horseshoe, but the public at large, and, and that's stuff that's in the works as we speak, I think. Yeah, um, we'd be happy to do that. We're trying to put some information together on that to kind of talk about <clears throat> more education on the process and look at, um, you know, I mean, we try to be very open with folks that you can come talk to us. We look at the project. We can walk through, you know, the the issues, the asks, uh, I mean, we, we do this pretty regularly, almost every day with different folks. So I'd be happy, Councilwoman, to, if there's someone that I need to spend some more time with, be happy to spend time with folks walking them through. Um, so did I just hear Council is gonna host for us a TIFF workshop? Is that what I heard? <laughs> Uh, that, that, that is what I have been speaking with Kenny about to help educate members on the horseshoe, right. especially new, newer members. We, we've been talking about putting together, I don't know if it's a work, workshop, it may just be a presentation, but um, on just all the different economic tools that we have, whether that's our SIP program, whether that's uh, TIF, you know, other ways that we have to, to assist projects and development. And that's uh, something that we've been talking about trying to put together to bring forward. And, and, and workshop was my term, not his. So. <laughs> yeah, you almost gave some people over here a heart attack I saw with that. <laughs> Last time we, I asked for a workshop, we had like a two and a half hour homelessness one. So, but I think it's a really good idea and I really look forward to that because I do, I do think it's, it can become complicated to sometimes explain to people some of these things. Um, I do have a request, and I'm sorry, I'm probably going to hurt some, some feelings on this. I don't know what to do yet about item AZ and BA. However, I absolutely know how I feel about item BB, and I would like to request a separate vote for that. Backstory, and I almost got up right now to go to my office to grab the initial uh, presentation on the Boulevard Place I received as a uh, public transportation trustee back in, I believe, 2018, uh, right before I went to that meeting. Um, and it was a rush of a day because then I had to go down to Dallas for uh, a college preparation teachers conference. Um, I mean, literally left from that. And I was so excited at that meeting because at the time they were like, here's what a one bedroom downtown apartment in this boulevard place is going to cost. And the reason why my trust receive the update just as a reminder um, is because it is going to be part of the public parking garage and remember our public transportation trust is public transportation and parking authority so we do both it's the parking garages and our public transportation um, services that goes back to the 1960s when COTPA first formed and imagine my just delight seeing just numbers in terms of rent for a studio apartment um, that would be truly what we call workforce affordable housing, a very important concept where people would be able to work maybe as a barista job, but a service industry job, maybe it's a daycare, what, what have you, and then they would be able to walk around the corner, maybe even bike around the corner to where they live, and that was the purpose of Boulevard Place when <laughs> first proposed. And it's important when you do, as you recall, workforce affordable housing, 
that that's not rhetoric with the language. It is affordable housing for your workforce. But when this item, and I, and I approved it as a trustee like with just joy and then drove I-35 to that college prep, just thrilled. So imagine when something I hear for a studio apartment was in the six, seven hundred dollar range, maybe it was eight, I don't, I, I'd have to go look right now. But what it was not was a thousand for a studio, and now it is. And now, and by the way, it was initially funded from the previous bond that voters approved in 2017 for workforce affordable housing because the public understands the need for precisely that sort of uh, housing in our city. But now to see this item come back, as it did, I believe, about a year ago for more funding, to amend this for more funding, and ultimately for rents that, if you're a barista at Elemental Coffee or Holy Rollers in my ward, you're not gonna be able to afford that one, that studio. Not one bedroom, that studio. And if you're a mother or a father and you are raising your child and you work at the Omni next door to where this building is gonna be, you can't afford to live there now. And for, for this ask to come back to build this, this uh, boulevard place and not meet the needs of our people, I will not support. And I'm asking for a separate vote on this. And to the councilwoman's point, I really just, I mean, maybe we're just too far in the process. And I appreciate everyone's work who has tried to make boulevard place work. But to Councilwoman Nice's point, at some point, you know, when I think of all the very clever um, projects which exist all across this country that are mixed use, mixed income, and we're not doing that, I, I just think this project should be scraped and scrapped, and, and we should be re-looking at other possible ways to do workforce affordable housing that voters actually approved in that bond. Um, I don't think, I mean, even if we approve this council, mark my words, your residents who it's supposed to serve, the workforce who are working in daycares, who are doing your coffee, who are doing your retail, ain't living there. And I think that's a shame. And so I want a separate vote on this, please, and I will, uh, not be supporting it. And um, I really would encourage, I am encouraged, in fact, conversations I've had already with folk in our business community, I think the next bond needs to prioritize, prioritize workforce affordable housing. It needs to prioritize mixed income, mixed use housing, and it needs to do so all across this city. <laughs> And thank God our housing affordability studies making that recommendation and it's not just coming from me. So just wanted to give you that backstory. I appreciate everyone's patience hearing me out on that. I, I, and, I, and again, I appreciate everyone's work trying to make this work. I just don't think it works for our people. Okay. But we haven't even, you wanted a separate vote on BB. We haven't even had the presentation on BB We have a short BB presentation. Yet, so. yeah. <laughs> no. I understand, we, your, but we haven't had the presentation To your point, yet, I Councilman, I mean, I, we wanted to do this short presentation. I do want to walk you through because um, it is a substantially larger ask, and, but I want to talk about a few things on this and why we would recommend bringing this forward. So <clears throat> before we start, um, you know, I think we as a city, we, we lean in harder on projects that are transformational in nature. I mean, to me, we've, in the past, we've looked at things that are uh, transformational office projects, tourism projects. To me, this is an, another step in our residential projects. You know, this is something that's much more vertical and dense than what we've had in the past. And quite frankly, these types of projects are hard. There's several of them I'm working on now. People are bringing on concepts. Once you get into steel construction, you start going more vertical. It is really hard right now with the inflation, the interest rates and things where they are. And I think it, it is a policy question of, do we continue the momentum that we have? Do we try to set the tone around core to shore area? You know, our planning processes that we went through wanted things that are seven to 15 stories around 
uh, the park, and this is an eight-story building. It's only one, it's about a 1.3 acre site to put that perspective, getting 265 units there. But I did wanna walk through, it is a substantial increase and I wanna walk through why. So we try to put this comparison up here. They had a deal uh, approved with the city and the trust uh, back in December of 21. At that time, it was a million five from TIF two. That is staying the same. As you'll recall, this site has lots of environmental issues. Um, at the time, the estimate was there was about $3 million needed for remediation, and the agreement was the city was putting half in for that. The developer would take the other half. The bigger change is the actual core to shore allocation. So before, it was $5.7 million, which that represented about 70% of the TIF generated for 10 years. Their request this time is 21.5 million, which would represent about 95% of the TIF generated for the first 15 years and 70% uh, for the last 10. I wanted to walk you through the why that ask has gone up so substantially. This project is at that time was 71 million, which really, I wanna put that because that's what it was when the deal was done. That, that number was up pretty substantially from their estimates before, but at the time they decided to move ahead. They're now at 83 million. So that's a $12 million increase in the cost of the project. In addition to just the cost of the project, at the time that this deal was done previously, their estimated interest rates were about three and a half to 4%, maybe four and a half percent. Today they're looking at six to 7%. So this is at least a 200 basis point increase on a roughly $50 million loan that we're looking at probably an additional million dollars a year of interest. So even if you just looked at like a 10 year, you know, typical holding period, you're looking at $12 million of additional costs to build probably around $10 million and it's a $22 million increase over that period. One of the other reasons this is so big is what they're asking on the 21.5, that would be a pay-as-you-go TIF. There would be no upfront money from the city. However, they are intending to try to go out and privately monetize that. So that's why, you know, to do that, you have to get reserve funds, you have to have debt coverage ratios. They think that'll generate about 6.7 million. The other piece of this I'll say is, you know, they've cut their developer fee in almost in half. Um, I believe that Last time when we looked at the estimates of what the returns were on this, it was 7% cash on cash annual returns. At, this, at these levels, it would be 4%. Um, this is just walking you through and acknowledging very clearly this is a su su significant ask. Again, I think it's one of those things that if this project doesn't happen, there's no taxes generated. This would be the taxes you know, that are generated within their project. I do think we could get something else developed there at some point in time. You know, it may take three, four, five years. You know, we don't know what it would be. I, and today, I would tell you, I don't think it would be this dense. We'd probably get something much smaller in nature. But um, that's, I think, the policy decision you have before you today. I did want, um, I think Tim and Stephen are here, the developers, to talk about the project and just remind you on some of the aspects of it. And, and then we'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Kenny. Uh, Tim Strange, Rose Rock Development Partners, Thrill One, with us 13th. Uh, thank you, Mayor, Manager, and Council, uh, for us being here today. We appreciate that. Um, I want to speak to Councilman Cooper's comments earlier. Um, we understand the increase in the uh, rental rate for the uh, the studios. Um, it's a different world today than it was five years ago. And we've been working diligently on this. Uh, project just about every day for the last five, five years to try to make it happen. Um, who foresaw uh, <laughs> increasing construction costs, you know, due to inflation, um, labor shortages, supply chain disruptions, and now interest rates, it's kind of the quadruple whammy to our project, but we're still excited about it and want to make it happen. Uh, we have cut our fees um, and lowered our returns in order to do that. Um, I'll remind you that um, we are not taking any gold bond funds for this project. Uh, there are 36 workforce housing units. Those are 80 to 120 percent of AMI. Um, also, we're the same team that's developing Alley's Inn at 4th and Gaylord, and that project is 211 units. 
uh, at 60% of AMI, so those truly are affordable units. So we really uh, are concerned about affordable. Uh, it's just this project in order to support the costs um, that are involved with it and to even uh, get the returns that we're looking at today uh, requires this kind of assistance. So I uh, appreciate your, your comments and concerns, um, but we're trying to meet that need for affordable housing uh, downtown as well through Alley's Inn. I'm going to let Stephen Watts speak to some of the numbers here um, that um, have changed over the last uh, five years. Stephen? Thank you, Tim. Stephen Watts, 5818, East 101st Place, Tulsa. Um, in terms of the numbers, um, when we originally proposed this project, it was about 53 million total project costs. Uh, it's now at 83 million, so it's a $30 million increase in costs. Um, as Kenny was, was speaking to, um, this is a pay as you go TIF. So this TIF is only from the increment that we generate on the project, uh, aside from the environmental uh, set aside for 1.5. But uh, it is the reason that it looks so much larger is because we are increasing the term of the TIF from 10 years to 25. Uh, that is necessary for us in order to uh, consider bonding the TIF, and at which point we think that we'll be able to get about $6.7 million up front. So when you look at that amount um, of upfront funding, the, uh, the number 21.5 versus uh, the $6.7 million up front, I think it's important to highlight what we can actually generate on the time value of money basis on those funds. Um, I will say after December of 21, we were ready to break ground on the project that coming spring of 22. Uh, when we got our construction bids in that spring, they'd gone from 53 million to 75 million. That's just our construction numbers. Our overall project costs at that time were about $100 million. So we had to quickly do value engineering, go back to the drawing board on a lot of our design. Um, we didn't change the height of the building or um, really the unit, um, the units themselves, but did some things to the facade, some things to the structure, the way that the um, piers worked, and we're able to shave about $12 million off of that $75 million number. Um, we also uh, had to switch our debt source. Um, we were, uh, at that time, anticipating being able to use a HUD market rate financing uh, that would have resulted in, at that time, a, a much lower interest rate. Now, that funding is at a much higher interest rate, and uh, that funding we can no longer utilize due to um, the subcontractor base, uh, more of a residential subcontractor base that we need to construct the project. So I wanted to just speak to those items and, and call out that we have been working hard to get the cost down um, from where we were last spring at almost 100 million now at 83. Um, and so we appreciate your consideration and open to any other questions you might have about some of those numbers that I've gone over. Any questions? I just want to thank Tim because I am remembering we had a conversation a year ago, maybe two years ago after this came back to council. And thanks for your reminder about your work that you're doing at Fourth. I think that's important work and I applaud it. Um, it's just unfortunate uh, as I stepped away briefly to look at the original 2018 numbers here. Studio apartment, 650 a month, max rent, 870. One bedroom, $900 a month, max 1300. Two bedroom, 1300, max 19. Um, three bedroom, 2400, max 2500. Like those are numbers that my, my people in Ward 2 can live with. Like we, that is, when I say live with, that is how much we can afford. And I understand it's, Five years later, and it's a different world. I, I, I experienced COVID with everybody else. My, and, I, and I know that I'm guessing a majority on this council exists to just move this forward. My challenge is to say that, and y'all know I love density, and to dispel some of the silliness I sometimes hear, I am pro-development. I want to say that very clearly. I am pro-development. That has been my whole thing on the transit board, transit-oriented development. That is a key thing that we do in the transit world. I just need de development that benefits more of our people. And so my challenge going forward, especially as we craft the next bond, is that we set aside way more money than we did previously to meet these housing and retail needs not just in the densest part of Oklahoma City's downtown,
But imagine if this is the sort of money we're willing to expend on just this one project right here on this one corner, what would this look like all up and down 4th Street? What would this look like 23rd and Penn up to, to May Avenue? And that's what my people are asking for in Cleveland neighborhood. That's what my students are asking for at OCU. I don't benefit from this financially, and I, and I really appreciate the, and I'm so sorry to hear it for you in a lot of ways, the cut that you're taking to try and make this project work. I guess what I'm saying is I'd like to see more of this sort of stuff happening across our city. And I am telling you all, like even $650 a month, if that is hard for a lot of our people. And if you don't know that, Go back to that quote I said for David Greenwell, hop on the bus, hop on the bus, like where the majority of the people are making under 20,000. Can I just ask you one question? Go do for it. You do understand that the money for this project comes from this particular part. When you say, I want to see this money spent here and there and there, like that doesn't work that way. Like it can't be spent other places. I understand that. What I'm, but there are other areas within these boundaries that we can Sure, you could have other projects, but you also need a partner. I mean, we don't build apartments. We need, sure. we need people to come and make pitches to us. So. Sure. I guess, <laughs> I guess on our side of it, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I guess on our side of it, I would like to see us be way more proactive in going out to the developers and saying, here are our needs. Here are our needs. Here are our people's okay. needs and help us meet these needs rather than waiting for people to come to us to the Economic Alliance office and saying, hey, I think I can do this. I, I would like to see us be very vision oriented and working with developers all across the city, especially the urbanists who know how to do this work, that's what I am challenging us to do, David, Mayor Got Holt. It. Got it. And Fair I enough. think to your point about that being proactive, that's what policy is supposed to be. It's supposed to be setting the tone and the requirement for accessing public funds. And what I see, not just with this project, but this one feels particularly pointed in this way um, and I, th I've, I mentioned this about a previous project that's very close to this, that this is an area of town where the city abandoned decades ago and the federal government subsidized people escaping the inner city to low density suburbs, but only certain people could access that. So when we talk about, it's not a, what, that it's a policy about continuing the momentum, that to me feels disingenuous because I feel like you could take that quote and maybe throw it back 60 years and it could be said, the same thing could be said, but what we're missing is it's not about policy about continuing the momentum of the development of this area, it's policy about who benefits from it, who benefits from the development and when we are patting ourselves on the back for a $12.5 million initiative, only $2 million of which is going to be public dollars to address homelessness and getting people actually back into housing uh, and, and with evidence-based, uh, outcome-based uh, methods, we're not actually changing the dynamics of 50, 60 years ago where we're using public funds truly to tackle these systemic issues. And when we not only lock out people who have a high rate of eviction or uh, have other barriers that make them chronically homeless, but we talked about in that workshop, people who are couch surfing, people who are doubling up um, because they cannot afford um, when we talk about it's a different world today, you know what's not really different for a lot of people is what their check says when that hits their bank. So, but you know what has changed for me in the last few years is my rent is going up. And I don't benefit in the long term from that. It, my dollar is becoming less powerful because all of these costs are increasing, but the people who do the day-to-day -day work of keeping the city running, uh, the, the baristas, the teachers, the nurses, the social workers who have to work two jobs just to cover their basic needs, and when they cannot 
integrate into developments that the city, that the government is subsidizing, we are failing people and, and we are continuing a momentum that is, in my opinion, sort of a you know, lipstick on a pig um, and that we're not really creating a city that works for everyone but we sure have some fun, cool, pretty press releases to put out. Um, and if we want to talk about property values and we want to talk about increasing tax base, you know, people sleeping on the street is not going to help that. People uh, struggling to keep their property up because they're on a fixed income and they're elderly and they can't, you know, paint the house or mow the lawn, those are the things that could be doing those incremental uh, impacts that really make a stronger city um, and stronger neighborhoods. And those are the things we kind of give crumbs to. Um, so then when we see these like large increases for these, you know, something that's, oh, it's high density and it's this and that. But again, it's, it's not about the momentum. It's not about the density. About, it's about who is benefiting from it, who can access it. Um, and more and more, it feels like well, it's not even feels like, it just is, uh, that we're just continuing the same dynamics and sort of, again, kind of prettying up a dynamic that was happening 60 years ago and just sort of inverting it from low density suburbs to the, back into the inner city into high density, but, say, but still only the same people can access. You know, we've maybe made a few strides and people, you know, getting generational wealth and being able to access certain things, but but this isn't it. Um, and and again, every time we pat ourselves on the back for the previous bond funds we've had or this initiative or that initiative, $8 million here for from ARPA, it, it just feels like we are nibbling at the edges of really being able to make an impact on truly, to Councilperson Cooper's point, that mixed income development, mixed, like, integrated socioeconomic neighborhoods um, to where it really does bring people up and changes the dynamics of our city that have proven to create a healthier, stronger city. And that's, I think, what I feel like is frustrating about <laughs> this conversation is it's not about, you know, it is about policy decisions, it is about priorities, but in my mind, and I think I've said it plenty of times before in these conversations about it's about at the day at the end of the day who benefits and who will have access and who will even feel like this is something that they can look at you know uh, will they go to the website to even see if they could afford it you know and and I think that's where we're we're really missing the boat and failing people go ahead go ahead thank you um Couple of points. I spent the last three or four days looking at this really closely, and um, I'm going to support the uh, joint resolution BB, but I want to walk through the reasons why. Number one, the incentives would be a pay in and pay out with no risk to the city. The incentives would all be generated by the project. <clears throat> Number two, this is, a, this is a, a piece of property that had serious environmental issues that nobody really wanted to touch um, years ago. And unfortunately, when we got into the environmental issues, it delayed things, and as a result of that, the developer is now faced with increased construction costs of about $12 million. And that's due to the environmental issues, as I mentioned, the pandemic, inflation, interest rates, material costs, and labor shortage. Number three, uh, the developer is faced now with interest costs, which have increased at least 2%. Um, on a $50 million loan, that's about $1 million per year in additional interest costs that the developer is going to have to deal with. Number four, the estimated cash on cash returns annually for the developer run around 7% or above back in 2021. Now it's moved down to 4%, so that's something else the developer is taking on. Number five, the developer has cut their developer fee in half. Number six, um, I think it's worth doing this because it sets the tone at a very important corner near the Omni Hotel and the new city parking garage. If we want to move this for city forward as we have done in the past, we need to look at this dense, the density 
and this vertical movement, which is really beneficial uh, and does set the tone for this property and, um, and the property in the area. Um, it will increase ultimately ad valorem. It will increase job creation and it will increase sales tax growth in the area. Uh, lastly, the developer uh, has put in its own money and what I, I estimate roughly around three million of its own. So the developer has really worked hard to make this project work. And there's one thing I'd, I'd ask you about, uh, Tim. You mentioned Alley's Inn. Can you tell me again the number of affordable units that will provide and what the AMI is at on Alley's Inn? Yes. Uh, thank you, Councilman. Uh, that will be 211 units and it will be uh, maximum 60% of AMI. Okay. I think that's an average, is it not? Yes. Yeah, so average 60% AMI. So you're not only working on Boulevard Place, you're also working on Alley's Inn to improve the city, correct? Yes, sir. All right, thank you. Thank you. And uh, I'm glad we brought up the parking garage because that was going to be my, my next comment. One thing that we do know for sure is, uh, as far as this parking garage is concerned, it's already stressed. And when I say it's already stressed, it's stressed to the point where we already uh, seem to be at a, a, a high level of capacity when we have the Omni that has so many of those spots, which I understand is by contract, not a problem. Um, and then this development will take up quite a few others. And we have the hotel that is already existing across the street and um, the convention center that is also across the street. So I park there. Uh, every event that I know is in proximity to this area. And I can tell you for sure that it is overly packed. And this development, as dense as it will be, will stress that more as far as us being able to have an area for public parking, for a public parking garage. So those are the concerns that I have when we're looking at, at that. Um, and also, I mean, we're talking about Ali's Inn, but the, the, the end game and the beginning goal was for Boulevard Place to have those same amenities, whereas now they will not. Um, and that is where the concern lies with this particular development. Now, understood, this can happen, but if this is not the right development, I promise you, there are plenty of people that want to develop within this area that can do something different, that can do something just as good, and that can make sure that they're paying attention to the community as far as having that mixed use and the things that we need. And in, in no disrespect, I'm hoping that um, as we heard about mixed use and the, the different conversations that our planning department is fully engaged in a lot of these conversations uh, when it comes to TIF and the economic development piece coming together of what we need uh, within our city as far as our developments are concerned. So, yeah, you know, we can, we can talk about that all day long, building all the way up eight, ten, eight to ten stories or whatever the case may be. But at the end, if you still don't have a place for these people to park or for even our community and neighbors to come down to this area to also uh, find and provide spaces for them to, to park, you know, what are, we, what are we doing as far as that amenity for people to, to benefit uh, from our public spaces that we say are, are for, the, for our city. So, I mean, um, for me, I, I will not support this. Councilman, I, uh, thank you very much for comments. Can I speak to the couple points you made, though? One is that um, our parking load of our residents will be largely at night because they will be out of the building during the day and jobs all over the city. Some will be working from home but um, I believe most of them will be out of the building. So the parking lot will be primarily at night, not during the day, when maybe convention events might be going on. Uh, the other item is that the RFP that we um, submitted for did not have a requirement for affordable uh, housing. It did have a requirement for workforce housing, and we did speak to that, and that's why we have the 36 uh, workforce housing units. So, okay, you. well, thank you for the workforce housing correction. But uh, even with that, as we heard the numbers, that's still uh, for a specific number of folks who probably still we won't be able to get in these places, which is the concern ultimately of what we began this conversation with even years ago when we started this conversation about Boulevard Place. So I hope you understand that conversation hasn't changed. Uh, 
Tim? Yeah, thank you for bringing this project before us. Um, personally, I, I think you're taking on quite a bit of risk for such a small return. Um, and I appreciate your willingness to go forward with that. This area needs to be, I'm gonna say, completed, finished, and this project is going to go a long way in filling in a, a gap that currently exists. If we have a parking problem, I'm, I'm surprised, uh, but yet we've got a solution in our uh, uh, transportation, our public transportation uh, services that we can provide, uh, including the streetcar. Uh, we can park further away from any activity and just use the streetcar to get around in. Uh, it's, I think, actually embarrassingly underused at this point in time. So, uh, but anyway, getting back to your project, Tim, thank you for bringing this forward. Uh, as we've said before, this is kind of self-funded within the TIF itself. The city's not at risk. Uh, so uh, I wish you good luck and uh, appreciate your efforts to, again, kind of finalize this area in terms of development. So thank you. Any other comments on BB? And okay, that ends the scheduled presentations. I, I note that you want a separate vote on BB. We'll handle that. Um, but we have a couple more items that council members wanted to speak to. So why don't we do that real quick? Councilwoman Nice, you wanted to talk about BC? Yes, um, I was just curious as far as the resolution extending the construction financing deadline and what that entails, if someone can speak to it. Which one was that one on? The BC was the one on Stiles Park on the construction, on the financing? Good morning, Council. My name is Megan Gelmers. I'm with BT Development on the Convergence Project. Um, this request is just for us to extend the financing deadline that was originally set in the real estate purchase agreement with the city <coughs> for Stiles Avenue and Stiles Park. Um, so just, just extending that deadline. Thank you. I'd like to have a separate vote on that as well, please. Okay. And then uh, item BE as well? Yes, um, item BE, I, I did talk to Ms. Vickers a little bit about it, but I'm um, just curious if, did we have anyone that signed up to speak on this item? Okay. Um, I was told that there may be some folks present that wanted to speak to it. And um, I guess one of the concerns or questions that was asked and raised to me um, were, the process of how these were chosen um, and, and also the one, some of our other record services that were not a part of, of this initial contract and the, the conversation that came thereafter with it. Um, I know for some, some of the other pieces of, of what I have understood is just trying to get, I guess, more, more knowledge of what this RFP process, maybe that's probably what I need to ask, what the RFP process looks like and, and how we go through that selection as far as, um, I know this is with our police department, um, but how we, how we manage and look at the different records and, and decide who we would like to work with? Maybe that's the question that I'm asking. So Captain, uh, I'm sorry, Wade Gorley, Chief of Police. Captain Randy Weens uh, was the one over the project and the process. So I'm gonna let him speak to this specifically because he can answer more of your direct questions. <clears throat> Captain Randy Weens with the Police Department. Um, we took over the managing the uh, record contracts a little over a year ago, um, and this year was the first year it's come up for actual uh, proposals to be 
submitted. Um, so per ordinance, um, a selection committee was put together and reviewed the proposals that were submitted. Um, and there was discussion about, you know, whether there was any complaints, prior complaints um, regarding uh, the current contractors, and then also review of the additional contractors that um, had submitted that don't currently have a contract. So is this an annual renewal? So this will come back to us again as far as that RFP going out and the selection committee visiting once more and deciding um, the factors that you just said for, for the next year? Or how long is the contract? Maybe that's what I should ask. The contract's a yearly contract. However, okay. it can be renewed each year for, I believe it's four years, um, without a new RFP. So that would be dependent on the council's vote at the end of the year. Okay. So we come back. So typically what we do with a lot of these contracts is we'll have an initial year with renewals, but each of those renewals will come back to the council each year, depending on when the contract is set, but they'll come back before the council. Okay. Well, um, due to just the folks that have reached out to me about this particular contract, I, I would like for us to revisit this within 12 months um, uh, to see what other options we may have as far as our records are concerned um, in ensuring that we have, and I understand that I do have an address for one, but uh, initially understanding uh, the, the locality as far as being local for, for what we're doing as far as our contractors are concerned. So that, that will be my ask of, as we do this again within a 12 month period. Thank you. Thank you. Captain, Captain, I've got a question for you. So uh, one of the uh, bidders on the contract was identified as an alternate. And one of the requirements to be identified as an alternate is that they would have a, uh, a vehicle ready 24 hours a day in case the main uh, selection was not able to respond. I kind of understand that, but I think if you're going to require that out of an alternative selection, that that alternative selection needs to be compensated to be on call for 24 hours, especially in a small business. They probably don't have the personnel just to sit there waiting for a call as the alternative. Uh, so if you do require that of, of an alternative, and I'm not trying to make a decision here, I'm just pointing this out, that it fe seems like an unfair request. I, I think the intent with the alternative, and you can correct me on this, Captain, is that if, if the other, um, whoever selected in that yeah. particular zone is not performing, that we could go to that alternate, as That's opposed to I like understood. they would just be constantly on call. Okay, but what this person believes is that they're on call 24 hours a day. We'll confirm that. Yeah, I, I haven't seen the alternate contract that was given to them, so I, I'm not sure on that. But but do you understand what I, I'm saying? If, what you're, if you're saying, asking yes. them to be on call for 24 hours a day, and they're a small shop, they just don't have the personnel to have someone manning a record from whenever eight o'clock at night till eight o'clock in the morning without somehow being compensated to provide that service. I understand. I, okay. We can absolutely consider that. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Okay, we have a resident who signed up to speak before we start casting votes, uh, Joy Reardon, on various items during the consent docket. What I had concerns with this project for BB, sitting back listening and everything, and it, I have a challenge for all the council up here and all the v developers in, that's in out uh, in the audience or in the gallery or whatever. Uh, when are y'all going to wake up to the ADA fact? I hear walkability. Walkability is great. Housing, I did a, a Google search for ADA housing. Do you know that Oklahoma City and a lot of your major cities 
has very, very little ADA, true ADA housing or apartments and stuff like that. Very little. I might find one, maybe two places that if I wanted to move from my current location to somewhere else, it's great for people that can actually walk. But what about the ADA community? And there's a lot more <laughs> ADA people out there that can't afford their apartments and stuff. But yet, the apartments has to be modified, literally modified. And that costs uh, the resident X amount of thousands of dollars to get that done. But if it's done in the building stage of the development to where it is a true ADA apartment and all it's like I keep coming back all the sidewalks all the entrances and stuff like that we're almost 30 something years into ADA when it was signed into law and we're still behind the times That's all I really ask is, let's, let's stop looking so much at people that are ambitory, which people walk around. That's called ambitory. And look at people that have physical challenges and stuff in home developments, in apartment developments, and stuff like that. That's my challenge to y'all. And 30, to the developers. 30 seconds, please. I'm good for now, but I will be back. Thank you. Okay, separate votes have been requested on a couple of items, so we'll start there. Item 9BB. Yes, can I, just a couple of comments mm -hmm, sure. on that. Uh, to the folk, Tim, uh, for the work you're doing, um, let me just say this, um, a few things. One, I understand as someone who teaches English composition and research, um, a tendency to want to be uh, conflict adverse, like that we don't, it's easier to uh, not express when disagreements exist than it is to express them because uh, hurt feelings can happen, defensiveness can happen, uh, so I just really first want to thank you for, you know, being up here and sharing your perspective, even though there were different perspectives um, from some of the folk on council. Um, and I recognize your intentions were probably quite good with this project. Like, I just really want to state that. Like, I recognize that. Um, and I'm guessing it's probably difficult to hear some of the um, counter um, perspectives that you heard here because Again, I'm assuming your attentions were in a good place here. Um, and I'm so sorry I can't support where we are right now with this work. What I'm asking, though, is uh, maybe some time for you all to kind of reflect on what you heard today, um, like where I'm coming from as the Word 2 council person in terms of the development that when I'm knocking doors, the things I'm hearing. Uh, the needs along the upcoming transit route on Class and an Expressway, the needs on Meridian, the needs on Portland, the needs on, uh, you know, Western. We, we have needs, um, and they're small business retail and their housing needs. And um, what I'd like to ask is maybe take some time to reflect on those. And just as we did last time after, you know, a vote that didn't go maybe the way you all were hoping, that, um, we sit down together and learn from each other because I plan on advocating big time. Um, I recognize that event, you know, initially this was a bond, right? And then we moved away from it. But I plan on advocating pretty big league uh, for more of this sort of funding in the next bond. And so I'd like to learn from you all what it's gonna really take to meet the needs 
of Ward 2 residents um, when it comes to these matters. Um, and I'm talking about redeveloping parking lots of shopping malls and strip malls, and we have not done that. And so your expertise from the development world will come in very handy there. So maybe take some time and reflect on it. I will as well, would be my, my promise. Um, but I just, I know sometimes I don't, we don't always align, but uh, sometimes we have to move past the conflict to find growth. And I just want you to know you, you have a partner and I'm gonna need your help because my people need, um, need this work. And please know I'm cheering you on with this work. I'm cheering you on. I do want to see it successful. So just thank you for giving me the time to say those words. All right, so do we want to take a motion on item 9BB? We have a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passes six to three. And then uh, we also had a separate vote requested on item BC, 9BC. I want you to take a motion on that. We have a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passes six to three. And then finally, we have the remainder of the consent docket that has not already been approved. And one of those items, AZ, was amended. This adopts all of those remaining items, this motion. We have a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. All right, now we're on item 10, the concurrence docket. Uh, we have items A through L we could take with one motion. We have a motion and a second, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Now we're at item 11, items requiring separate votes. Um, Joy Reardon is signed up to make a planning docket introductory um, uh -huh. Are you, you're good? Okay, okay. Uh, item 11A is an ordinance on final hearing recommended for approval, uh, rezoning 8305 South Santa Fe Avenue from R1 and PUD 893 to AA. Um, no one has signed up to speak. Councilman Greenwell. I'll speak. <laughs> Thank you, Your Honor. Oh. <laughs> Uh, he, How about he's, that? He's the applicant. Okay. Mr. A. Duddle. Sure. Would you uh, introduce yourself? Yes, sir. Uh, David A. Duddle. I live at 12008 Remington Road, Oklahoma City, 73170. Uh, we own the property and have uh, for 26 years raised bucking stock, bulls, horses, and stuff. And about January, city code come by and said we were not in compliance, put us in time out, and said you're going to have to do something. So uh, I said, what do we need to do? They said, uh, rezone it, double A agriculture, you're good to go. So we uh, put all three laws together and are zoning it and hopefully it'll pass and we can go back to doing what we've been doing for 26 years there. Thank you, David. I don't think I've ever seen anyone in my five years rezone to double A. Yeah, no, 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 this is a first <laughs> and I am just disappointed that Joey is not here <laughs> for us to address this in front of him because uh, maybe we can get him back in, I don't know. Well, we'll, I'll, we'll bring it up later if that's okay, <laughs> Mayor. But sure. for right now, this was approved unanimously by the Planning Commission. There's no opposition, no protests. So I move that we approve this. May I, just as a quick note, just a clarification, um, my understanding and it's really funny about the AA, um, and I do wish Joy w was here. My understanding, though, um, having met them a few years ago, is that they uh, identify as, as them, they, them, and she. So I just want to, I've heard that a couple times from the horseshoe. I don't think oh, it's, yeah, I don't Sorry mean, about I, that. I know, I know, and I know you don't mean that by yeah. any name. I know you, yeah. I just wanted to clarify that. Thank um, you. You're welcome. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passes 
passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Appreciate it. Sure. Thank you. Okay. Item 11 uh, B is an ordinance on final hearing that was recommended for approval rezoning 5925 Marshall Street from AA to R1. And Councilwoman Nice, we do have William Solomon who has signed up to speak. Okay. Good morning. Yeah, my name is William Solomon. And uh, yeah, we bought the property and we're just trying to, uh, it's agriculture and we try and get it rezoned so we can uh, uh, develop uh, our dream home uh, in, in that community. And we're just hoping to, hopefully we can get it passed. Okay. Well, all I gotta say is I wanna see it when you finish this dream home, <laughs> please. And thank you. Um, and with that, I will go ahead and move for approval. All right, thank you. We have a motion and a second, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. 11C is an ordinance on final hearing that was recommended for approval, rezoning 319 South Check Hall Road from C3 to R2. Uh, and Councilwoman Peck, no one is signed to speak. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, familiar with the project, I'll move for approval. There was no protest that planning was recommended for it as well. All right, we have a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Item D was already deferred, which brings us to item 11E, an ordinance on final hearing recommended for approval, rezoning 15425 Southwest 15th from AA to PUD 1932. Councilwoman Peg, no one is signed to speak. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Planning Commission approved it subject to summary of technical evaluations, and I'll move for approval today. Got a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passes seven to one. Uh, item 11F is an ordinance on final hearing that was recommended for approval, rezoning 419 Northwest 25th Street from R4 HL and Jefferson Park UCD to SPD 1466 HL and Jefferson Park UCD. Councilman Cooper, known to sign up to speak. Is the applicant here though? I didn't see Fallon. Um, yeah, this is a really neat um, redevelopment and it goes back to my conversation earlier where someone has taken a, uh, an existing house that seemed quite dilapidated, some structures behind that were quite dilapidated. And this is an example of uh, the applicant working with within a historic preservation neighborhood and all these different conservation districts to do something that will in fact meet the needs of um, of the, the, the people in Ward 2 and anyone who wants to join us in Ward 2. So I just really applaud the imagination here and look forward to seeing more of those. And I will move for approval. OK, we have a motion. You have lots of motions. Second. Everybody wants in on this. Motion and a second. Cast your votes when you have the chance. Yeah. What is it? What are you doing? Oh, turn it off. <laughs> Wait, so we're waiting on somebody? Oh, yeah, no, I'm yes. I mean, it's going to be yes next time. Yeah, you would like to be a yes. Passes unanimously. All right. Uh, 11G is an ordinance on final hearing. It was recommended for approval, rezoning 904 Northwest 23rd yes. from C3. Wait, am I repeating something? What? Why is everybody speaking up? Did I do something wrong? Oh, no, sorry. I, <laughs> I made a throat noise when I turned on my mic. OK. Uh, C3, UD, and TT to SPUD 1481, UD, and TT. Councilwoman Hammond, no one is time to speak. Yes. Um, can we just have the uh, 
applicant come uh, explain the project, um, just so everyone knows. But it did uh, pass planning commission um, unanimously and was recommended for um, acceptance by staff, so. Good morning, Mark Zitzai with Johnson & Associates, address is Winnie Sheridan Avenue. Uh, this is a redevelopment uh, of a few older homes that have seen fairly extensive renovations over the years. And so in our work with the planning department, I think they were determined they were non-historic because of the number of renovations that have occurred to the facade. And so our client seeks to uh, construct a project uh, to bring some new multifamily to the area. Uh, we have coordinated uh, with the designer on the 23rd Street streetscape street enhancement project. Uh, so the lane configuration, sidewalks and parking, uh, we have worked through that with them uh, and we hope to see that project kick off soon. But I'd be happy to answer any other questions you might have. No, I don't have any questions and if no one else says, I will move for approval. Motion in a second, cast your votes. <clears throat> Passes unanimously. Item H is an ordinance on final hearing that was recommended for approval, rezoning 140 Northeast 14th from R3 and DSHA to SBD 1497 and DSHA. Uh, Councilwoman Nice, nobody has signed up to speak. Okay, thank you. Um, this is to permit single family residential development. And if I'm not mistaken, it'll be up to uh, at least four, maybe up to five. Um, and oh, yes, it's about five. And I will say um, I have some very active neighbors in the neighborhood and um, the most vocal have supported this. So therefore I will support uh, their support and move for approval. Motion in a second, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Item I is an ordinance on final hearing recommended for approval rezoning 2000 Northwest 23rd from R1 and Gatewood UCD to SPD 1499 and Gatewood UCD. Uh, Councilwoman Hammond, the applicants are available for questions. Okay, um, well, I don't have any questions. Um, this is a pretty straightforward case and was uh, recommended for approval from staff and had a unanimous vote from Planning Commission, so I will move for approval. We have a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Item J is an ordinance on final hearing recommended for approval rezoning 16216 Ironstone Place from PUD 1382 to SPUD 1501. Councilman Stone Cipher, no one has signed up to speak. Thank you, uh, Planning Commission re re recommended approval of this rezoning. It allows for commercial uses and development, including an animal urgent care clinic. There are no protests that I'm aware of, so at this time I'll move for approval, please. All right, we have a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Item K is an ordinance on final hearing recommended for approval rezoning 1619 Northeast 9th from C3 to SPD 1502. Councilwoman Nice, no one is time to speak. Okay, thank you. Um, is the applicant here? Okay. Um, I did have questions. I emailed, so I'm, I've been waiting for those questions to be answered, so I'm not sure. Where, where to move with this as far as, um, unless you can answer these questions. Uh, the questions that I asked were, are these um, owner-occupied homes? Yes, so my understanding, Kenton Sudel uh, with representing Okira, these are on Okira lot, so I've just been given this information. I don't know why the developer was not available today, but my understanding is it's two two-story homes that are being built. One will be facing 
east on 9th Street, and that's where 9th kind of curves around, and the other one will be facing south, similar to what was historically there uh, before it was zoned commercial. But um, I, it's my understanding they are being built to be owner-occupied homes. Okay. I don't have a whole lot more information than that. Uh, okay. Um, well, that is, again, where I, I have some concern as far as understanding the owner occupancy and the fact for both of them, if that's what both of them are going to be, uh, owner occupied. All right. Well, I'll go ahead and move for approval. All right. We have a motion and a second. Cast your votes. passes unanimously. And now for item L and onward, I'm going to pass the gavel to Vice Mayor Stone. Thank you, Mayor. That brings us to item 11. And this is the ordinance on final hearing recommended for approval. The rezoning of 1821 Northeast 26th Street from R1 single family residential and HNO overlay districts to SPUD 1503. Ward 7. Thank you. Um, this is to permit a multifamily residential development up to 32 dwelling units as well as um, veteran housing. So um, did talk to the applicant on yesterday about some uh, additional asks uh, for this development and he did comply to that. So with that I will move for approval of this application. We have a motion and a second. Please cast your votes. And the item passes. Brings us to item 11M, ordinance on final hearing recommended for approval. The rezoning of 333 Northwest 96th Street from R1 single family residential district to SPUD 1504, Ward 7. Yes, thank you, Vice Mayor. Uh, this is an application um, for industrial use and development. Um, my only concern, and I know it was discussed through the Planning Commission uh, as far as the application, um, is the industrial use and, and how in the proximity of the R1 area and I know there were some asks as far as um, how this would be facing um, to not impede on the residents. So I will ask that two things, uh, as far as the ordinance and how we introduce that to our residents being published and mailed, uh, I, I would like for, uh, I, I would like to see it um, and also for the developer, um, I would ask that we are very sensitive to the residents that are within this community um, because they have been there a lot longer than what we're trying and working to do. So that's my ask to you, that we are still paying attention and being sensitive to those residents with this use. Um, and thank you for, I saw there was no medical marijuana sales growth or distribution. So I appreciate that. So with that, I will move for approval. We have a motion and a second. Please vote. And the item passes. Brings us to item 11N, ordinance on final hearing, recommended for approval to close 100 feet of Northwest 71st Street and 150 feet off the east-west utility easement in Block 1, Manor Hills, Manor Hill addition east of Classen Boulevard, Ward 2. Is the applicant here? Oh, come on up. Yeah. We, spoke on the we spoke on the phone, but um, maybe share a little bit about what you're up to. Uh, my name's Todd McKinnis. I represent the applicant, Jeff ah, Cowan, so close. who you spoke to on the phone, so I apologize. Uh, Jeff got called out of here and couldn't stay. Uh, Jeff has Cowan Engineering. 
It's a growing, successful engineering firm in Oklahoma City, and they bought this property from the Cooper family, and they're expanding it. And so part of that expansion is the closure of these two items that don't have any connectivity on either way uh, or, or either side of them. So I know Mr. Cowan spoke with you, Councilman Cooper, and I think you all discussed a couple issues about his plans for the property, mm -hmm. but I'll be happy to try to answer any other questions you might have. Yeah, well, and just tell Jeff I appreciate his time a couple weeks ago and his uh, work in the area. And just to clarify, they didn't buy it from this Cooper family. We uh, ain't what we do, uh, but, <laughs> but uh, just would move for approval. Thank you very much. All right, we have a motion and a second. Please vote. And the item passes. Brings us to item 11-0. Ordinance on final hearing recommended for approval to close the 50-foot portion of the east-west alley in Block 15, Bell Vern Edition, west of North Kentucky Avenue and north of Northwest 9th Street. Ward 6. Yes, this is um, a pretty straightforward closing to um, assist with development in the, on the, the site, so I will move for approval. We have a motion and a second. And the item passes. Brings us to item 11P, ordinance on final hearing, establishing, establishing a reserved parking space for the physically disabled on the east side of North Chartel Avenue from approximately 58 feet south to 90 feet south of the south curb line of Northwest 11th Street, Ward 6. Yes, I saw them doing work here just the other day, um, so glad to see this uh, distinguishment or establishment of uh, of the 88 parking space, I'll move for approval. We have a motion and a second. And the item passes. Item 11 Q is ordinance on final hearing establishing a reserved parking space for the physically disabled on the west west side of North Walnut Avenue from approximately 51 feet north to 78 feet north of the north curb line of Northeast 26th Street. Ward 7. Uh, yes, um, we'll ask that we approve this application. We have a motion and a second. And the item passes. Brings us to item 11R1, the public hearing regarding dilapidated structures. And we have some of the signed up. Jennifer Arsenault. Did I say that correctly? Close? Close. Arsenault. Arsenault. Yes, very good. Good morning, council members. Give us your name and address, and we'll sure. go from there. My name is Jennifer Arsenault. I'm a Oklahoma City resident. I have an office at 51st and Western. I'm a real estate broker and have a real estate brokerage there. I was hired uh, this last summer. Our firm was to represent a a Salvage. They have a property located at 1300 South Robinson. Um, the family's been there since 1978. It's something that was inherited. There's municipal code that's changed that allowed them uh, to not transfer their uh, salvage yard license to any other family member or to sell the business itself. So when I sat down with them, we very quickly realized the property, any value is not in the business itself, it's in the property, and began to work towards um, planning an auction, closing the, the, the building, closing the business itself because of the health of the, the owners. Um, in September, a city representative came in and um, was misguided as to the statutes, told them they needed to move everything, uh, all 700 inoperable vehicles within the next 10 days because they were not uh, operating properly, when in fact they were, it was grandfathered in. So we took 
made a lot of calls and worked through that. Um, the city, you know, recognized that it was a mistake, the code inspector. Um, after that, we got to work and got very busy out of concern for his health and because of the pressure from the city with lower scissor tail opening. While we're very excited about that, the gentrification process has been very difficult for this family personally because it was their legacy, this business. So um, since then, uh, we, we hired Dake Hill. Uh, he was an auctioneer who came in. The month of November was spent uh, taking inventory, photographing all of the, the, the chattel property that was there. And um, in November, there was a fire that began uh, early Monday morning. Uh, it was before employees were set to arrive. During that time, the owner of the property was in the hospital. Uh, they were uh, amputating a foot of his at that time. Um, in December, we went forward with the auction of what property was still there, um, got bids for removing the property, bulldozing it, found out the family, uh, the, the insurance on the property had been canceled. Um, he did not realize that. The first quarter of the year was spent with a lot of hospitalization time for the owner. He has lost both of his lower limbs now. Um, we've worked with, talked with different developers, uh, have a lot of things that we're working towards, um, have been great to, to I, I don't have to go into all of that, but um, what we're asking the city today is to go ahead and give us an opportunity. The, the owners didn't receive the notice. They do have the mail forwarded. I did receive it Wednesday via email. Um, the city officials were kind enough to meet me there Friday. We walked the property. We looked at the concerns about the metal buildings uh, that are off to the side that weren't secure. I spoke with the owner. They are going to have those welded closed. Um, the concern with it being uh, deemed or blighted in this way, I think one, it impacts marketability. Two, it can impact the cost uh, to tear down the building could be increased because of the additional work that would be required. So um, what we'd like to ask you members today, if you could postpone hearing this matter until the month of May and give the owner the opportunity to have these things taken care of and remedied in that time. Go ahead. Um, Mr. Chad, will you come and speak to this? And I had to, I'm working backwards because I had to, uh, this was sent to Council Member Hammond, so now I'm, I'm reading it. Um, will you help me to understand from the beginning of this <coughs> as far as the inspection process that they are referring to, uh, to where we are today as far as being told they were operating, um, they were not properly operating this business at this time? Sure, I, th I think it was last, it was either September or, or October, one of our inspectors went out to the property. Uh, they had had two vehicles that were being stored or had been dropped off in front of their fence and in an attempt uh, to let the property owners know that those needed to be placed behind the fence, uh, they gave them some inf misinformation. Um, so as soon as we found out about that, I contacted the um, property owners directly and advised them that was not the case and that their property did conform or was legal non-conforming or grandfathered in, as she alluded uh, to. So that, that was remedied fairly quickly told them the property was completely compliant at that time and business as usual. November comes, they have a fire at the property. Um, I had not received a complaint on it until just recently where we started receiving a lot of complaints about the condition of the property. It is directly across from Lower Scissor Tail Park um, and does you know, have a significant impact on the health, safety, and welfare of the community. The property owner, although we did attempt to notify them, has not changed their information with the county treasurer or county assessor's office. And we did receive mail back late last month that had not been forwarded and did not have, or late last week, I'm sorry, that does not have a uh, forwarding address on it. So um, that's kind of where we're at today. Okay. Um, is there a reason why we have not changed the address? I actually, when I spoke with the owners multiple times, they actually said that they do get the mail, that it has been forwarded. Um, they see the yellow strip on it. They had not received anything from the city. OK. 
Okay. I don't know if it was mailed certified. Um, it's, it's mailed via uh, mailing certificate as required by the state statute. Right, we send it to the address, in, I believe in the county assessor's records. That's correct. And so whatever that address is, we mail it to them and we get a receipt that we have mailed it and that is sufficient legal notice. So it doesn't matter whether they receive it or not. We've given the notice required by statute. I guess that's where the concern is for another case that we have closed, the receipt of being known in, in understanding that they have received it. That's a concern for me um, as we go through all of these processes because unfortunately things get lost in the mail and, and therefore people end up getting a double notice without even knowing they had a first notice and then we're caught in the system. So those, that's always the ultimate concern for me because we've already had to deal with that uh, once with a, a, another resident and property. So what I will do um, to, for this is, um, in, in my, my empathy for the owner of this business, um, I'll, I'll go ahead and, and offer, ask that we, we do two weeks for deferral. Uh, and I will, the reason I'm going to ask this, uh, one, I passed this on Sunday on my way to the South Side for the, the Children's Festival. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I do see, not to say it's fully secure, but I, I know there is a gate around the property. Uh, so it, they're, not to say that's the safest way for people to not uh, impede on the property, but I understand that that is there. So I will go ahead and ask that we defer this for two weeks, um, but I will ask that we work on either changing that address on the record, whatever needs to be done, uh, in order for us to make sure we continue to have conversation with you all on this property, if you don't mind. Absolutely. All right, thank you so much. And for that, I will ask for that we defer um, item that item on the agenda. Thank you. All right, we have a motion and a second on the uh, two-week deferral for item R1A. Please cast your votes. And the deferral is approved. Brings us to item R2, which is the resolution declaring structures are dilapidated other than the previously deferred item. We have a motion and a second. Please vote. That item passes as well. <coughs> Brings us to item 11S1, the public hearing regarding unsecured structures. And no one has signed up to speak. So we will move on to 11S2, resolution declaring structures are unsecured. We can take a motion. We have a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Oh, that's better cast I apologize. Yeah, we've the got it. The last matter that we just heard, was the property included, it was listed twice on the agenda in two separate sections. It's under 11T, which we're just coming to now. So, we're good. And Councilwoman Nice, the, that item passed. On 11T, item H, would you like to make a motion to move that for deferral as well? Yes, please. All right, we have a motion and a second to defer item TH two weeks. Please cast your votes. And the item is deferred. Moves us to item 11T2, resolution declaring the remaining buildings are abandoned. We'll take a motion and a second. Please vote.
and the item passes. All right, brings us to item 11U. Mr. City Manager, yes. we have a presentation. Yes, Vanessa Aguilar, Business Manager for the uh, Water Utility Trust, will uh, give us a quick presentation on this authorization for uh, indebtedness. Good morning, Vice Mayor and Council Members. Vanessa Aguilar with the Utilities Department. This agenda item that you have before you today is a resolution that authorizes the Oklahoma City Water Utilities Trust to incur debt in the form of a loan with the Oklahoma Water Resources Board in the amount of $2,225,000 for the purpose of funding a project to identify and verify lead, potential lead service lines in Oklahoma City. As background, in 2021, the EPA updated its lead rule, which required water utilities to create and maintain a public database that identifies the material type of service lines in the city. Since 2021, Aquit has created a tabletop analysis based on logical assumptions identifying the potential for lead service lines in Oklahoma City based on the year of the property, the premise type, and location, as well as the main size. With this loan proceeds, we'll be able to go to the next step, which is a phase one of the project, which is to validate and qualify our assumptions. So we'll be hiring a contractor to go out in the field and do a pilot program to certain locations that we've identified that have the potential for lead service lines. The Oklahoma Water Resources Board, through grant funding from the EPA, offers loan forgiveness opportunities to fund lead service line replacement programs. So the Oklahoma Water Utilities Trust is eligible and will receive 33% loan forgiveness on this loan, particular loan. Staff recommends approval of this agenda item and we're happy to answer any questions you might have. I just have one. Um, is it possible to get a list uh, like per, well, at least for Ward 7, if you have specified areas of where you're going to be looking at as far as testing? Yes, we can provide um, the information. So this afternoon at Aqua, we'll approve the contractor award. Once that contract is awarded, we'll be able to connect with the contractor to identify those service locations. It's primarily in the central part of Oklahoma City and the southern part, but we can provide more information as it's available. Any other questions? If not, we can take a motion on item U. All right, we have a motion and a second. Please vote. And the item passes with the required six votes. Brings us to item 11D, claims recommended for denial. I've been told we don't need executive session. So we can take a motion on item D. We have a motion and a second. Please vote. item passes. Brings us to item 11W, claims recommended for approval. We can take a motion and a second on those. Please cast your votes. That item passes as well. Brings us to item 12 on the agenda, comments from council. Ward 1. None today, sir. Thank you. Board two. We just want it noted for the last few, I have not. Before I, no, the last several, right now I am. Um, but before I begin, uh, Councilwoman Nice, would you mind, because it was new to me, would you mind telling us a little bit about what the 79th annual BMA uh, the Baptist Ministers Association, what that was before I tell them about my attendance, <laughs> please. Sure, um, I, I know I had mentioned at our last council meeting that this is, it's a, just a simultaneous revival where they bring in uh, pastors from across the country and the, the furthest east we had was Washington DC, the furthest west was um, Los Angeles and we had a pastor come from Florida so that tells you we, we covered all of the places in Ohio. Uh, so we really had a, a lot of coverage as far as where we are in every sun, on that Sunday, 
they bring a, a pastor in to, to speak to culminate uh, the revival for the week. So um, it's 79 years, we'll be celebrating 80, and this is the longest running revival uh, in, in our nation. Thank, thank you for that backstory. Um, it was, first, thank you for your invite to attend as well. I walked in right as the choir was like kind of hitting fever pitch and it was just magical. Um, and then to hear uh, this pastor speak from the book of Matthew, the story of the resurrection and, and just with this lyricism in his voice, it was really something. It was really, really something. So just wanna thank you for that. And on a related note, I haven't got to say this publicly, but thank you to Councilman Carter for inviting me to his church a few weeks ago. So I'm just boot scooting along churches right now, I guess. I don't, I don't know what's going on. Um, I just wanna thank you all for that. Um, I also wanted to thank uh, the Labor and Friends uh, Banquet for uh, calling Ward 2 home for their 50th annual celebration. They were at the Roe Rogers Theater and they asked me to deliver the keynote speech and I was honored to do so. Um, and, and I thought that was, it was really fun. I also want to thank the Mayfair West Neighborhood Association for inviting uh, myself and some other elected representatives to do a litter pickup on Saturday when it was cold, <laughs> uh, but we did. And uh, all I kept thinking the whole time as I saw that litter alongside I-44 in you know, Drexel areas, I just kept thinking as a child, don't lay that trash on Oklahoma, and I, I'd like to maybe see a bit more revival of that, that campaign. Um, and then just some patience for this next bit, which again will be a bit uncomfortable, but this is from ABC News. With a population, I'm quoting now, of about 31,000 in bordering Arkansas and Texas, uh, McCurtain County is part of Oklahoma known as, quote, Little Dixie because of the influence in the area from white Southerners who migrated there after the Civil War. Although 60% of the county is white, there are significant numbers of Native Americans, 18%, black folk, 8%, and Hispanic folk, 7%. Like many communities across the country, particularly the South, the towns in McCurtain County were historically segregated, but have become more integrated since the 1960s. Idabel, the county seat, was the site of racial violence in 1980 when a riot erupted after a local black teenager was fatally shot outside of an all-white club. Tensions grew so high that martial law was declared and the governor called in the National Guard. What didn't help, uh, this is from local historian Kenny Sivard, what didn't help was when the Grand Imperial Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan came down to Ida Bell Courthouse and made his appearance. No, that didn't help matters at all, as you might imagine. The county also has a long history of lawlessness dating back to days before statehood in 1907, when Oklahoma was Indian territory and bandits would take refuge in the mountainous region. So that's unfortunate because this is an article uh, from ABC News where uh, the residents of this county are really worried because with its clean rivers and remote locations, this area has also become recently um, a site of revival. Um, and that's, that's really unfortunate, that's, a good, that's good, uh, but that's unfortunate at the same time because they were overcoming a recent reputation um, where methamphetamine as an epidemic had swept through the area. Um, and so, you know, here you now have the Choctaw Nation's uh, historic reservation encompassing the entire county and most of southern Oklahoma, and the tribe has actually broken ground on a $165 million, 200,000 square foot resort hotel and casino near that lake in Beaver's Bend State Park, and it's scheduled to open later this year. As you've probably heard me speak previously, my father is from Idabel. My, in fact, he's actually from a, a smaller town right outside of Idabel called Tom. And I was born in 1982, which means my father, when he moved up here in 1980, would have moved from McCurtain County as those riots occurred. So I'm speaking today, I hope, to the folk who call McCurtain County home to know that the people who are up here in Oklahoma City 
Uh, we are all Oklahomans. We're all in this moment together. M my father's blood runs through me. And um, it is of grave concern to me when I hear people say, um, and this is elected officials saying this quote, uh, and for the kids, I'll, I won't cuss. I'll just kind of take out the cuss words uh, the way that movie Fantastic Mr. Fox did, where they would just say cuss instead of the cuss word. But, um, you know, there was someone, and this is um, still up for investigation, but supposedly, here we go. Um, there was a sheriff um, saying, quote, they would take a cuss word black guy and whoop their cuss word and throw them in a cell. And uh, the response was, yeah, it's not like that anymore. But we used to take them down to Mud Creek and hang them up with a cuss word rope. But you can't do that anymore. They've got more rights than we got. That was the sort of rhetoric I had to undo all the time in my middle school students. When you read the history books of Oklahoma, we know that governors used to tell black folk Hispanic, Latinx folk, Native American folk, that they weren't capable of being doctors and lawyers. They were only capable of holding certain types of jobs. They weren't capable biologically of going to law school. They weren't capable by the Bible that God in Christianity himself had said to segregate the races. My grandfather on my mom's side, as I've mentioned previously, Grandpa Abner, a white Pentecost, used to go preach at black churches in this area and get in trouble for doing so from church leadership saying, you can't do that, Abner. God wouldn't like it. And he said, I'll go anywhere people want to hear the teachings of Jesus. So this history is, is, is not done with us, unfortunately. And I just want the people who are down there protesting right now and advocating um, for redevelopment and for better elected officials, I want them to know that they have a solidarity here in their capital city. Um, I want them to know that. And uh, it breaks my heart to know that all the hard work that some folk have put <laughs> in is undone by people who still hold recalcitrant backwards uh, dumb, dumb ideas about um, what a person of color is capable of being and achieving. Um, and I would just conclude by saying that during my recent re-election, I received a letter uh, from not this county, but a neighboring county uh, down by McCurtain, a young queer man who sent a letter to my home and a $10 donation to the campaign saying that he had seen that I had won as a openly LGBT person of color, and it encouraged him. We don't know what we are doing on this horseshoe and who is reading um, our work and the hope we are putting into people by the actions we take in this capital city's uh, municipal building. So um, I'm so sorry to have to bring up something so nasty, um, but you shine light on it, and when you know better, you do better. So, thank you. Thank you, Ward 3. Ward 6. Yes, um, just a few events coming up. They're both actually this Saturday um, that I just want to invite folks to if they have not heard about them. Um, one is uh, Commissioner Carrie Bloomert is hosting a coffee with the commissioner and has invited myself and Representative Ellen Hefner um, to join her. That'll be at uh, Not Your Average Joe's in Midtown, um, the location on Walker, uh, at, from t at starting at 10 a.m. and we'll just kind of go to whenever, but just an opportunity to come and connect and get updated about things happening at city, county, and the state level um, for folks that live in any, all of our, our districts and wards overlap. Um, and then also on Saturday from 10 to 3 p.m., Period OKC and a host of other partners are hosting the Oklahoma Menstrual Equity Summit. Um, it's a free event. They just ask that you RSVP so they can have numbers and know who to expect, but just an opportunity to convene with a lot of folks that are um, doing advocacy work in the space um, and hear sort of the state of menstrual equity advocacy um, throughout central Oklahoma and I believe even Tulsa. 
Um, and just again, that opportunity to uh, hear from folks impacted by um, and having experienced issues accessing menstrual products um, and, and those what, what we can do as a community to help support anyone who menstruates that struggles to afford those, because I think anyone who has been in that place knows that it happens to us all at some point that, um, that we might struggle to um, pay those bills and any opportunity we have to come together and really change the narrative about um, you know, the, the access conversation to essentially just a run-of-the-mill health need um, is, it will be great. So they will be serving lunch. Um, it's all day, but um, I know for myself, I'll, I'll only be there in the afternoon because of the morning event um, at Not Your Average Joe's. So, you know, there is a some come and go aspect to it that if, if you can't make part of it, please still feel free to join when you can um, to just, you know, I think uh, just wherever in the conversation you can fit, um, fit in where you get in. So thank you. Yes, um, I'll say I have my ticket. I'm ready for Saturday. And um, as we speak about, continue to speak about access uh, for menstrual products, one of the things that I will mention is our, our Jimmy Stewart Clubhouse. Um, went in the restroom there, and it's no charge uh, for access as far as our, our menstrual products. So very um, grateful that our, our parks department and, and uh, those who built that facility understood uh, the need for that, that access. Um, as Councilperson Cooper, as you spoke towards the end, it, it brought up a a quote by Ida B. Wells, the way to right wrongs is to shine the light of truth upon them. So your, your comments about McCurtain County were spot, spot on uh, as far as it, it needed to be said. It, it, the light um, needs to continue to shine uh, about what is happening and has continued to happen to uh, folks that live within the area of Ida Bell, uh, Hugo, and in the areas that surround it. Um, so thank you for that. And solidarity is definitely uh, within uh, my, my scope as well as we talk through that. And um, I will say uh, I did not get to make it to the labor banquet, but I have heard nothing but great things about your presentation and your speech. So congratulations to you. Uh, a lot of folks called me and said, Nikki James Cooper did an excellent job. And I, I said, yeah, he's a teacher. Uh, so what do you expect? He did some research. Um, but again, congratulations to you for that. Um, I do want to commend our Midwest City, our neighbors in Midwest City for their immediate response to what happened at Rose State College on yesterday. Uh, very unfortunate uh, that the action had to be put into play as far as their their drills that they do with the students and have done, I believe they said 30 days prior, and literally had to put that into real effect on yesterday. Um, so it could have been an, a worse, but very grateful that, that they responded in the manner that they did. Um, and that all is well um, as it can be. I know classes were canceled today uh, but just thinking in the lens of, of getting ready for finals and all of the things that are happening, my, my, my heart to definitely with all of those students. Um, I know last Tuesday I wanted to mention that A.C. Hamlin Gala uh, was from our leg Oklahoma Legislative Black Caucus. Wanted to thank them for the invitation uh, to be a part of that and, and got to see and, and talk to some fellow council members that also uh, attended. It was a well-attended event, and they haven't been able to do that since 2019, and they do it every other year. So very grateful uh, that we had a, a good turnout and, and raised in $20,000 in scholarships for Langston University. Um, a couple more things. One, uh, Children's Day Festival, I will say I did get to go. I missed the roll call as far as when they uh, announced the folks that are there, but I did enjoy myself and, and enjoyed just being a part of, of what that day brings for our community and our neighbors uh, that reside in the south side of Oklahoma City and, and to celebrate culture. That's what it's about at the end of the day, always uh, being open to celebrating culture and especially celebrating our children. Uh, but the reason I was late was because I was at the Avery Chapel AME 
they had their 134th church anniversary. And one of the things that I found out, which I didn't know the history of this church, is the same day that we entered statehood was the same day this church formed, 134 years ago. So in, in the same lens of, of our city, our, our state taking flight and, and molding itself, uh, this church was establishing itself and is still standing 134 years later. So to be able to just be a part of that history um, is just amazing and, and very grateful for the things that they do within our city and within our community. And the last thing I wanted to mention is um, when I, keep, I kept and I continue to get calls about these potential county detention center sites. And one of the things that um, is, is quite frustrating is the fact that when we have our, our city entities um, that are a part of uh, these, these sites or these places, it would be nice to at least get a heads up that this is coming, um, that this is happening. Um, so therefore, we can speak to it. Because I can't speak to this when people call me about this particular site. Um, because it involves our water trust uh, also saying yes to being included in this and, and that speaks to um, our leadership as far as being able to have that information on hand to at least know that that is coming. So disappointed that I did not know until it happened and, and still have not had a conversation understanding what the next steps are. Warden, nothing today, Vice Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. That brings us to item 13 on the agenda, citizens to be heard. We have two. The first one is, I hope I don't mess up the name, Herrero Avila or Avila? I wasn't sure if it was an R or a V. I'm sorry. R. R, okay. If you could give us your name and address and please limit yourself to three minutes. Okay, my name is Horacio Avila. I live at 60, uh, 4714 North Broadway, Oklahoma. And the reason that, that I'm here, that we need, I come out as Bihabas. We had a baseball league like for over 40 years. We used to be at uh, Independence, you know, they did the new baseball field. They said they were gonna give it to us, to us when they had it done, no. They moved us to Reno in May. And we've been there. Uh, I just started taking over the league last year. And we end up, last year we pay about 3000 for the rental. This year they're asking about $9,000. And we are, most of, most of them, we're Spanish, low income tax people. And, and he said he has took over, but uh, we have some police officers that, that play there and they, they look him up, Mason Williams the, and Parks. That he is his first year, and, and he found out he'd been there five years. And the reason he, to, he told me that all the people before him, they were not doing the, or at least in the park the right way. So everybody before him was wrong till he got there. And they were, they were rented us to us as a practice baseball field. And now they're, they're doing it the right way, supposedly, as a, uh, as a baseball league. And we wanted, we wanted to just get it and be heard. We, we have this league for, for over 40 years, and we don't want, they want to take all, all, all over it, but we told them we want to keep like our traditional. We're not asking it for free, but we want a reasonable price. And we, we wanted to see if anybody could, could help us. We, we can have someone from our parks department visit with you about that. I know we've been looking at all of our um, pricing that we have on the, um, fields, the various fields, so we can have one of our, uh, someone from our parks department speak with you about that. Yeah, can because we? I've been speaking to Mason, and, and we're already playing there, but uh, we're supposed to renew it for June, and, and the price is just, we, mm -hmm. we just, we don't want it for free, but we want something we could afford. Yeah, we can visit with you about that, but we try to be, we try to be consistent in how we're charging that to everyone using the fields. We can definitely visit with you about it. Can, can he meet with someone today while he's down yes, there? Yes, I'll do my best to get someone. I gotta make sure I've got someone back don't, there. Don't leave yet, we'll try to get someone to visit with you today while you're here. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. 
I know that raises a concern for myself as well. I think this is like the fourth different person I've heard come up and go, I don't know what's going on, but yeah. they can't afford youth sports. And it, it, I don't know if Parks is trying to do their own programming or what, but there's something wrong. We can take a look at that. I mean, I know we've been resetting a lot of our fees and trying to make it more consistent in what we're doing and charging all the fields that we, that mm -hmm. we rent out. And we do have some of our own programming. We try to make sure we make it available to everyone. So we can take a look at that. Yeah. Thank you, sir. All right, up next is Joy Reardon. Come on down. Told you I'd be back. Again. Joy, if you can give us your name and address, and please limit your comments to three minutes. Thank you. Every time. Um, Joy Reardon, 125 Northwest 9th. Uh, the two issues that I think I put down was one was ADA and the other one is events. Um, on the agenda this morning, uh, the accommodation for the Arts Council uh, at the beginning of the meeting and everything else, that was not on the agenda or I would have uh, put down that I wanted to speak out about them. They are, have at least 15 violation, ADA violations. If I was to go out there to the arts uh, festival, I couldn't go to the bathroom. They have no ADA bathrooms. That's one of the biggest things with these permits and stuff that I would really like to get emphasized is uh, one is the ADA bathrooms and stuff, accommodations. Two is the fact that uh, the, um, there's the ADA violations that they're having, blocking off sidewalks, blocking off curb cutouts, stuff like that. It makes it real difficult. I can pretty much get around, but people in, like with uh, walkers, uh, manual wheelchairs, stuff like that, even people with limited sight and stuff, can't get down the sidewalks, can't get off the sidewalks, and stuff like that. And it's not just that, that event. There's other things around, around the city, and the scooters are getting worse. I've had to move uh, seven of them to come down here today to the city council meeting. And every time I come to city council, I ask the same thing. One of these times, the scooters are going to prevent the fire department from doing their job because they're piling them up around the, uh, the fire hydrants and stuff. When, are, when is that problem going to be fixed? Think about your loved ones being able to get, get down a curb cutout that's in a wheelchair. Seconds, please. Okay. And the other thing is with your uh, two events that's happening on Saturday, you forgot uh, the two major events that's happening this weekend too. The memorial uh, run. Saturday is the uh, 5K and the kids. Sunday is the half relay and full. So... Uh, but yeah, the biggest thing is the ADA stuff. I will keep pounding the pavement for that. If y'all could at least address that, I'd appreciate it, along with a lot of others. And a lot of the ADA events around the, around the United States, they see what's going, they're very active on what, what um, they're very active on cities that, they want to have conventions and stuff. That's the reason why I try to, and a lot of the ADA uh, people has money to spend. Walkability is great, but let's, let's think about putting ADA ahead of a lot of the walkability stuff, please. Thank you. Y'all have a blessed day. All right, that brings us to item 14 on the
um, agenda, which is adjournment. Thank you.